when Master Evil comes to play. And Mama says that it's okay. Alex and Josh are stole away and made to watch these movies to stay alive until the day they made us. Well, prisoners, I see you have nothing to do. And we all know idle hands and all that. So I have a job for you. I'm looking for filmmakers to produce my biopic. Master Evil! Everybody wants to rule the world. And I'm going to use you to bozos as my interviewers to help me find the perfect director for my life story movie. So tonight you will be interviewing the director of Jason Goes to Hell and Secret Santa and the upcoming documentary Hearts of Darkness the making of the final Friday. So go on, prisoners, and vet Adam Marcus for me. I will be watching and expect to know every detail you can possibly get about his experience in film. Now get to work! Ma! What's for dinner? Me and Mr. Fliver want lasagna! Okay, I didn't have anything else going on here. Uh, I have uh, Sister Evil dropped by and was doing a list of things, torture ideas, I guess. You still got the rodeo clown over there? Yeah, but he's been really quiet lately. I, I he just and he's got some sort of thing going on with. Uh, he's got sleep apnea, but he doesn't snore. He just giggles. Okay, it's creepy. <laughs> wow, it's really creepy. He doesn't snore. He he like. <laughs> oh my god okay yeah. that, that's, yeah, that did... never happened I never heard that before whenever he was here uh, uh, maybe he's putting it on I don't know what's going on but it's it's odd because I can barely sleep over here as it is because I'm really uncomfortable but this is making it like almost unbearable probably echoes in the barrel too um, so we get to talk to another human being the only thing I'm worried about is the last time we did an interview with somebody we got well not the last time. That was with uh, Ryan Thomas Johnson. But the first time we did an interview, when we first met Master Evil, we ended up yeah. getting kidnapped and held prisoner. So, But hey, we get to talk to a, a real Hollywood filmmaker, Adam Marcus. That's going to be cool. Uh, I'm more excited to just ask him if he can help us out than to ask him any questions about his career, to be honest with you. If, I've, if it's full disclosure... Because I'm tired of this living situation. I'm tired. I'm sick of my life, to be bad honest with movies, you. Bad movies, man. Bad movies. That's pretty bad, too. Um, got another one coming up soon. What do you say? We'll hit him up. We'll ask some questions. And I mean, Master Evil's watching, so we don't want to be too... We need to be kind of subtle about it. Um, not like we were with Ryan, because that didn't get us anywhere. Yeah, I think that made things worse, but I can't remember I, I, after, I don't know what happened. It's almost like our memory got wiped and I only remember the terrible movies. I, it's like, there's a blankness, like, yeah. like a, not like a heavy night of drinking, I guess a heavy night of shitty movies blacks you out the same exact way as a heavy night of drinking. I wonder if master evil did something with our memories at some point. I don't know. I, you know what? And sometimes he'll randomly give me pills. And he'll say they're what? vitamins and they're good. Yeah, they just says they're good for me. But and you take I, I don't know why. What, what am I supposed you don't to take do? Them or something? <laughs> I never thought about that. Yeah, that's what I do. I got a whole uh, jar full of them. Um, oh, so you're saving them like you're saving them like James Con did in Misery, then, huh? Yeah, I'm gonna give them back to one of them if I ever get the chance. 
So uh, I guess we're going to connect with Adam Marcus. Are you looking forward to this? Yeah, I am. I'm just I'm hoping it's actually Adam Marcus and not some terrible prank that Master <laughs> Evil has Mr. Flibble planned. dressed up as Adam yeah. Marcus. Because the last time, remember what happened when he said he was going to get you a Katy Perry calendar? And yeah. it was just, you know, it's him. Katy Perry. Yeah, it was just him dressed up as it's different weird. Katy I Perry like I album covers. I feel like I shouldn't be able to remember that, but I do. It's weird. That it, well, certain trauma, I don't think you actually remember it. I think you more along the lines of you just feel it. <laughs> it's just in your DNA. Yeah, I just like it printed on you. All right, let's, uh, let's open up the vault and uh, talk to Adam. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Getting Sidetracked with Alex and Josh. Uh, tonight, we've got a great guest. Uh, you know what, Alex? Uh, introduce our guest. Well, it's my honor to introduce Mr. Adam Marcus, the director, the writer. Uh, even even appeared in the film uh, for Jason Goes to Hell. Uh, he's also the writer and director of Secret Santa, which was released in 2018, I believe. And uh, on his Twitter, his uh, pinned tweet is actually the trailer for the film. And uh, it's just it's action from right off the right off the word go. So if you go Love check it. that trailer out on Adam's Twitter. And uh, Adam is in the process of uh, putting together Heart of D Hearts of Darkness, the documentary for Jason Goes to Hell. So we're we're all really looking forward to that. Thanks for coming to the show, Adam. Thank you for having me, guys. Yeah, man, I've been wanting to get you on for a while. This is great. I know you've been so busy, and I you know really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. Um, and I, again, I'm sorry that it took so long to make it happen, but I'm so glad that we did. Hey, five years is five years. Whatever. Man. I hold no grudges. <laughs> but I do, I, I do got to tell you, man, Secret Santa, uh, before, before we go way back and start at the beginning, I wanted to you know, say that was a great movie. <laughs> I had so much fun with Secret Thank Santa. You. Thank uh, you. I appreciate that. I would love to see like a continuation of some kind. Uh, you we, know. we have a, um, uh, a sequel in the works. Uh, which happens during Easter Sunday. Oh, gosh. <laughs> the resurrection. Oh. It's, it's, it's pretty intense. It, it, the whole thing takes place uh, in a church for an Easter Sunday wedding. Uh, and it is horrifying. <laughs> like, it makes Secret Santa look like the Fisher-Price version of what we were doing. So it's, it's pretty, pretty outrageous. Wow. Yeah. I yeah. got to say... I can tell that you're normal people because all the character, everybody has people in their family, uh, like the characters in Secret Santa. You know, the, you got the annoying person, the stuck-up relative. Uh, it was perfect. <laughs> and he, there's Thanks. always been times we wanted to see him eat each other. You know, yeah, uh, oh yeah, that's normal, normal stuff. Um, yeah. Well, Josh, at my know. house, uh, we had to eat each other sometimes on holidays because you know we didn't have a lot of money, uh, so. Maybe cousin Bob would be on the menu later on. You know, you don't know. You have no idea. He didn't come next year, of course. <laughs> you know, because he's dead. We he's remembered dead. him yeah. fondly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I wanted to uh, start off with uh, this little film that you made um, back in uh, the early '90s. Mm -hmm. uh, some people might know it. Uh, Jason goes to hell. Um, that had to be an amazing. I, I know you probably talked about this a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, hopefully yeah. you don't mind talking about it some more. Yes. I, yes, I have spoken about Jason Goes to Hell a couple of times. Um, it was it, it's great, man. I don't know, you know, it's a lot of people got got some strong opinions about about the movie, but yeah. I'm one of the biggest defenders of like Jason Goes to Hell and Jason X because mm -hmm. the movies had the balls to do something different and and take it to the next step. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, Jason Takes Manhattan, it was just, uh, um, so, so it was refreshing to see something cool like that. I played Jason Goes to Hell on the playground. Uh, me and my friends did. We'd take turns being Jason. That, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, we got in trouble. That's the only uh, way to play tag. That's, a <laughs> that's pretty much what it was. You know? Yeah. Uh, you'd kill somebody and then they were Jason. It was yeah. weird. Um, but Alex, uh, had, had some questions about this movie, uh, and I've got a couple myself, but I'm going to pass it to him. Uh, we got to get okay. past the awkward stage here, so, uh, uh -huh. let's go for it. 
Well, yeah. okay. Now, Adam, I got a hold of you, and you actually got back to me. This was about a year ago on Twitter. And uh, I had asked you, um, <laughs> I'd ask you how the coroner, how his photo uh, was taken by the, you know, hard, by the hard copy uh, TV show that, uh, how the hell did they get their hands on the photo of the coroner who, his name is, his last name's Laurie. He's one of your, he's one of your production. Uh, no, didn't he write the film? Dean, Dean wrote the film with me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I knew that I, I was aware of that, but I, I didn't know that he, he was the guy who played the coroner until I was doing a little bit of research. And I'm like, that's, that's the same guy. Now, if Jason, I don't know if, uh, the promoter from Rocky five, I don't know if he was taking a photo of your buddy at the time, how they sold the photo to the newspaper. Well, how the hell did that, what do you think happened? It like the heart, the, the uh, current affair, uh, yeah. program. How did they get yeah. those tents? Right before he's dead. It's, right. he's, he just got the pizza. A absolutely. <laughs> um, you, you have to remember, okay, so here's exactly, here's exactly how the art direction on that went. Okay. So Sean Cunningham, while I was shooting the film, had to get all the stuff for the Chiron graphics for American Case File, right? Okay. So Sean was the one who was like, oh, no problem. I'll get us what we need. I said, great. And what he did was he took a photo off the editing bay <laughs> from the dailies. Instead of just asking the actors, hey, can you guys pose for what would be your ID badge photo? Something. I mean, something. <laughs> Maybe that was his ID badge. Four <laughs> seconds. Okay. But remember, remember, guys, back then there were no phones. There were no phones that had cameras on them. So you would actually have to take a photograph and then have it developed. You know, <laughs> things that a filmmaker would do. <laughs> and he did not do that. So, um, so there's your, there's the truth of it. I'm okay. sure Sean. I'm sure Sean's response would be, ah, oh, there were. Video monitors, video <laughs> cameras, picture thing. It's still, it's still not, it's still not uh, as big of a head scratcher as uh, Friday Five, uh, when it's got the like photo, the photo, oh, the photo, dude, <laughs> the photo yeah. with the newspaper clipping. Yes, yes, where you're like, wow, that and that photographer was never seen again. <laughs> never seen again. They just <laughs> we recovered his camera <laughs> and the last roll of film, but the photographer is no more. Exactly. <laughs> that was the first found footage film ever made yeah. by accident. All right, Adam, uh, I'm going to let you kill something tonight. You get to yeah. kill my fan theory that I've talked about on uh, with Alex and on my other podcast. Okay. Um, I've always had this fan theory that uh, Jason, that I think I've talked to you about it a long time ago, yeah. uh, Friday 8 and Jason Goes to Hell have a little bit of a connection because uh, I've always, in my head, I've always played it out like this. Jason got washed away in the toxic sludge at the end of part eight. The one, the girl had been seeing hallucinations the whole time, so the little cowering kid was just another hallucination. Right, right. Jason got washed away, got his mask, stuffed it on his, you know, stuck it on his melting face, and uh, that's why in Jason Goes to Hell, like, it's like grown into his face and his head's all messed up. It's from the toxic sludge bath. That, that was always my fan theory. I know it's not, but kill uh, it. Wait, wait, I think it's a great theory. And honestly, like, look, the people who love part eight, I would be like, go with that. That is okay. awesome. I'm all in. Sounds great. <laughs> okay. The truth of it is, um, Paramount hated part eight so bad that they sold the Jason Voorhees character. They literally sold him because they went, we want no more of this, okay? Sean Cunningham literally told me day one of working on this film, my rules were this, and this was the rules. Can I, is it okay if I, I use a language? Is it okay if I swear a little oh, bit? Oh, use as much as you Say want. Say whatever you want. Fuck, yeah, you guys are my fucking people. Awesome. So, here's okay. the thing. Um, Sean Cunningham said, get the fucking hockey mask out of the movie and I'll let you write and direct it. That's first. Second thing he said was, you have to ignore that Jason Take Manhattan ever happened. And the third thing he said is, I want a fresh kill every seven minutes, a fresh pair of tits every seven minutes, and break them up in three and a half minute increments. Did he want yeah. it in the movie too? Huh? Did he want the fresh tits in the movie too? No, no, no. I had to come in and do a dance. In oh, okay. <laughs> um... Okay. So uh, that was that was literally those were my marching orders. Um, Sean loves to kind of 
make up a different version of this um, as though I'm the one who said, we need to take that mask out of the movie, Sean Cunningham. I was 22 when I, when I got the job, by the way, guys. So 22-year-old me told 50-plus-year-old Sean S. Cunningham, you know, the guy who created the biggest franchise in horror movie history, I told him what he was going to do with his franchise. <laughs> That's how that worked. Yeah. Oh, anyway. God, Sean. <laughs> right, exactly. I'm just starting exactly. to see that meeting. I'll do the movie, Sean, but you're going to take that fucking mask off of Jason. Exactly. Okay? You know, said the 22-year-old. I mean, it, it, yeah, uh -huh. that's how that works. Um, so here's the thing. Um, I was not allowed to even reference that part eight had ever happened. And so our my initial treatment for the movie started with Jason at the bottom of Crystal Lake. So that was the, the, the initial version of this movie, guys, was so much darker than what you got. I mean, guys, I wrote a movie that was, that was, um, it, it was like the Serbian film version of a Friday the 13th movie. Like, <laughs> it was so angry and ugly, and uh, Jason was at the bottom of the lake at the beginning. So I had to start from there. When things like, I wanted Tommy Jarvis to be the hero of my movie, um, that was really important to me. And then they informed me that Paramount had only sold them what was in the original script and the hockey mask. That's it. That's all they sold them. So I couldn't use Tommy Jarvis. I could only use stuff that was in the original film. Um, it's also why we didn't, it wasn't called Friday 13th, because yeah. we were not sold the title. We were not allowed to use the title. So the original title of... Jason Goes to Hell, was Friday the 13th, The, uh, the Heart of Darkness. Okay. And that's why, the, that's why the, the, the documentary is now Hearts of Darkness, the making of the final Friday. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, I actually really enjoyed the way the movie kicked off. I enjoyed the whole movie, but I thought, I thought the uh, beginning was really cool. And uh, you know that I narrate out of print like books and stuff mm -hmm. on my channel, yeah. Jason. One of the books I narrate narrated was called Hate Kill Repeat, and there's an FBI agent as one of the main characters, a woman. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the movie, since she battled Jason during the movie, she gets a gig to go back and set a trap for him. So this book took the liberty to. It was like the book was like a replacement for Manhattan. Like it, right. let's say, man, Jason takes Manhattan never happened. This is your part eight. Yeah. And they, like, tied it seamlessly into Jason Goes to Hell. The book ends with them setting up the uh, beginning scene of your movie. That's uh, so awesome. I, that was, I love yeah, that. I it's, like, cool. it's, like the, it's like the Rogue One of uh, of Friday. By the way, I, I actually, I refer to Jason Goes to Hell now, not back then, but I refer to it now as the Rogue One of the Friday 13th franchise. Because the, the, the important thing to me and the reason, and look, it was, it's why I had to create an ideology. If I was going to get rid of the mask, suddenly I had to have magical thinking. And I'm like, okay, how do we reverse engineer this to make it work in the movie? But my big problem with the Friday films, and again, guys, remember, I, I, I was around the set for the first movie. Mm -hmm. I watched every cut of that film. Um, you know, I saw it months before anybody saw it in the theater. And then I saw every single Friday movie multiple times in a movie theater as a kid growing up, sometimes with the Cunningham, sometimes on my own. And like, this was my, you know, this is my childhood. Like, this is how I grew up. My problem right with part two, and by the way, this was Sean's problem too. He never talks about it, but he, hate, he hates the Friday 13th movies. He right. hates them, okay? He is not a fan. Um, my problem with the movies was that Right in part two, I was like, wait a second. That's the kid from the lake? Yeah. It's been two months yeah. since... How... What, do you eat a tree? Yeah. Like, how is that the same guy? That was a kid. So here's the thing. You got a kid living in a lake for 30 years. Right? Um, at the end of the... At the beginning of the 80s, he is still a child. So... The lake, waterlogged, evil, hydrocephalic headed child is still a child. So that's magic. That's not, we're not on planet Earth anymore. The fact that from in two months, 
he gained 120 pounds of muscle, learned, found clothes that fit him, learned how to read, because the only way you could find somebody back then was in the yellow pages or the white pages. <laughs> Then he got a driver's license, hopped on over to Alice's because he learned how to drive. He killed her. Oh, by the way, he brought his mom's head with him. He kills her, then takes her body and the head back to Crystal Lake to his little shanty cabin, right? Okay, so if we're going to, we're buying that, right? That's not, Now, by the way, the number of fans I know who have tried to legitimize this idea as like, well, that can happen. No, no. It can't. I mean, yeah, he, I love I love that the Halloween franchise gets shit for the fact that Michael Myers can drive. Right, yeah. Well, hey, like, it, it, at least Jason was smart enough to bring his mother's head because then he could use the carpool lane. So. So, see, I didn't even think of that way. You know what I'm talking about? He on the way back. He, but, but you know, there. he hadn't been able to work for 30 years, so he has he doesn't have a lot of money, so he's got to be economical about this trip to murder Alice, so. I'm just telling you guys, that's what I think happened. The book for the movie uh, tries so hard to like make it, make it all make sense, and it's just so convoluted uh, right. how it goes By down. The way, there's nothing, look, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a horror movie. I get it. But yeah. my sense was, if we're going to go there to part two, by part four, he has been murdered so many times. He's been fucking killed a bunch of times, this character. Finally, Tommy... He cuts his head into hamburger meat, and we all were, like, cheering, and it was fucking amazing, and what a great thing. By part five, it's not even Jason anymore. It's a different character. Part six, <laughs> he's resurrected a la Frankenstein's monster in a graveyard with electricity. Now he's zombie Jason. And again, everybody's like, that's cool. By part seven, he's battling Carrie. So I love that Sean's cinematic larceny from the end of part one suddenly comes back to haunt him in part seven, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So now he's battling Carrie. Then he goes and takes the circle line around Manhattan, right? Okay, so when they get to me, I was like, hey, guys, can we go back to that problem between one and two? Can we, like, can we solve that? So that's why <laughs> the Necronomicon <laughs> is in the movie. That's why. Okay. And that's what I was doing. So much like Rogue One going, um, hey, um, that whole thing in, in the first Star Wars, you know, when, when there's a four meter hole big enough to <laughs> put, a, put a blast down and that will make the entire Death Star blow up. Isn't that a little bit of a design problem from the people who made the Death Star? Well, Rogue One, yeah, like I was out of my mind when I saw Rogue One because like, Finally, someone <laughs> answered this. This is great. They had to make a, a whole movie for it, but yeah. <laughs> but Jason Goes to Hell truly for me was about solving the logic problems that even as a 12-year-old, I was like, none of this makes sense to me. Someone explain this. Well, what if what if when he got out of the lake, when he saw his mom die, right? And as soon as the air hit him, he went into like instant puberty and 30 yeah. years of aging all of once that's why his hair's all messed up it's exactly you know? the way it works in biology and he yeah. sprouts clothing you know well josh he should first of all if jason really did see his mom get killed okay and he's taken out his aggression for you know 40 years on all these counselors the only person he should be pissed off at is himself because he saw her get killed why didn't he get out of the water and go do something I know, right? well okay but here wait but here's my here's my thought on this and why why i built it the way i did my feeling was Pamela would do anything for her Jason to come back. That's that that's what she lived and breathed for. She she yeah. she loved this child. The way any mother loves their child, no matter what that kid does, no matter how fucked it is how fucked up it is, that mother loves that child. Great. So now you've got a woman hell bent, literally and figuratively, on bringing her son back. Great. So wouldn't she turn to the dark arts at some point? Wouldn't she? Wouldn't she fig try to find out if there's some way to resurrect him through those means? Yes. Well, guess what? There's this book of the dead that if you read from it, you can reanimate people. And again, I know that people go, "Well, is he a deadite or a revenant?" I'm like, "Oh my god, jackasses! It's a big book. It's not two <laughs> pages. It's not the one page you hear repeated seventeen times in Evil Dead films. It's a book." So. 
I figured if Pamela does resurrect Jason, now imagine this. Remember, Jason is a special needs kid. Now you've got this special needs child at the bottom of a cold, dark lake. He has no idea where he is. That's his hell. Here's this kid, all he can do is look up and he's terrified of the world and he's definitely terrified of camp or of counselors. Those are the people who will be around him. So why would he go back up to them? They're the ones who hurt him. Children hurt him. Here's this, still this scared kid, even though he's been resurrected with this evil. Now, he sees his mom at the edge of the lake. First time he's seen his mother. He starts coming, coming up from the water to get to his mother, to his mother, to his mother, and Alice cuts off her head. Alice gets out on the canoe. For God knows what reason Alice is on a fucking canoe. <laughs> and right. he leaps up and pulls her down into the lake. And that's his first act of aggression. And yes, at that point, his, his rage and the fact that the one person who protected him in the real world, the fact the one person he really loved is now dead, that makes this, this thing rise from, from, from the depths of Crystal Lake to become the golem of vengeance that will come after anyone who remotely is like Alice. So... That, I went, okay, I buy that story. Now, here's the thing. I didn't own anything from Evil Dead. I just got Sam Raimi to hand me a, a Necronomicon and let me copy the dagger, which he was very sweet to do. He was, it was awesome. But I couldn't use the words Evil Dead. I couldn't get into that. So I went, great. We're going to imply all of this. So in the Voorhees house where Pamela and Ray's Jason, there's the Necronomicon. The dagger that, that Creighton Duke has is the dagger. Like, it's, it's all just right in front of you. And again, if I understood it, and I'm a big horror geek, I was like, well, surely all my horror geek friends will understand it. And literally when this came up, I don't know, eight years ago, nine years ago, when f finally someone said, why is the Necronomicon in the movie? Not, it's cool that it's there, what a great reference, but why is it there? I was like, oh, thank God. Right. Because. <laughs> because of all of this. <laughs> that, that's awesome, man. That actually, wow. I, ho I hope people watching right now, uh, you know, that hadn't thought of that, puts it all together, because that's really cool. There's actually a book, uh, The Mask of Jason Voorhees, that goes into some of that, in, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Um, uh, William did a really good job on that. Um which is another question I wanted to ask you about the movie. First off, like all I got stuck in my head right now is Jason driving to go to Alice's and someone cuts him off and he's like, oh, you just cut off the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the actor, man, you got, you got the guy from the TV series. What, like, how did that, how did that whole thing happen? I've never heard this story. You know, that's John, a question John I really LeMay. wanted to ask you. Yeah, John D. LeMay. John yeah. is, uh, first off, first off, he's, he's an amazing dude. Um, what happened with John, this was, a, it is a crazy story. So what happened was um, I had already cast somebody in that role. I would cast the actor, Jonathan Penner, um, to play Steven. Okay. Jonathan Penner, uh, amazing guy. Um, he is, most recently he wrote The Bye Bye Man, which his wife, Stacey Title directed. Stacey just, just died a few months ago, guys, um, from ALS. Uh, amazing woman, like really incredible filmmaker and a great lady. Anyway, Jonathan and her, and her had been working together for years. They did an incredible movie called The Last Supper. If you've never seen it, you got to see it. It's unbelievable. Like, amazing film. Um, it's so good, guys. Trust me on this. So The Last Supper, you got to check it out. So Jonathan was an actor at that point. He hadn't been screenwriting yet. And he was in Amityville 92, It's About Time. It's one of the leads of that. He had done a bunch of, like, kind of cool little movies. And I met with him, and we just hit it off instantaneously. We're friends to this day. He's an amazing guy. He, oh. end, he ended up not because... Uh, we had to push production two months because Bob Shea came back from France. He had been away for three months and saw that Mike DeLuca and Mark Rodesky had greenlit our movie and he lost his shit oh and was God. like, this, this, is, this garbage needs a rewrite. Unless uh, I get a cameo. Sorry. Which is a whole <laughs> other story, which is hilarious. 
Uh, so we had to bump for two months. Well, we lost Jonathan because of that, because he had another film that he'd already scheduled. So we, um, so I said, look, I said, I still want you in the movie. Can you come out for a day? He was like, dude, of course for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm there. So Jonathan ended up playing Vicky's boyfriend, David, in the scene that got cut that now you can only see on the Blu-ray and stuff. The, the guy, his, he basically gets naked and gets his fucking head bashed into the sink. Um, and yeah, it's all, it's a great scene and he's <laughs> cool. awesome dude. So I had that guy, he was supposed to be the lead and then he fell out and I really had like weeks to recast and it took a long time to get, to get Jonathan involved. So I was like, what the fuck am I going to do? Well, my first AD, uh, a guy named Sam Mahoney, who, by the way, Sam went from our film and then he first AD Pulp Fiction, like right after it. Wow, um, Sam, Sam's a, Sam's a badass. He, I don't think he's an AD anymore. He, I think he, uh, he moved to Denver and he has a bar now. He's an awesome guy. Anyway, Sam, uh, he was like six foot four, the spitting image of Michael McDonald from the Doobie Brothers. Um, but just a badass. He said to me, he says, he says, uh, Adam, hey, uh, I worked on that Friday 13th, uh, the series. There's a guy on that show who's just dynamite. And I was like, oh, you mean the guy who plays the lead, John LeMay? He's like, he's great. I said, isn't he a little young? He says, not anymore, man. <laughs> and he just had a birthday. <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally, the guy comes in. John comes in like two days later to meet with me. We sat down, had about a, an hour and a half discussion, just talking. I didn't want to, like, don't read for me. Let's just talk. And uh, he totally got what I was trying to do. And he was kind of, he was like, you know, I, I've been doing the series. Most people don't even know the series exists. We're like a little show, and it's great that we're doing it. But the show had wrapped up, and he was like, I'd love to actually be in a Friday the 13th film. And I was like, all right, let's do it, man. Like, Sweet you're awesome. Heck. So the guy, you know, he's a beauty, like seriously trained actor. The, my, my, it, my only issue with John, and we, we battled on set about this a lot, I really wanted him to play it, you know, kind of close to Bruce Willis and Die Hard. Yeah. And he wanted to be Hamlet. And I was like, listen, dude, it's a Friday 13th movie. Like, you got to lighten up, Francis. Like, we got to <laughs> have some fun, man. We got to, like, this has got to be fun, you know? Uh, but I will say, we met in the middle, and it was cool because he has some moments in that movie that are so beautifully acted that I'm so like proud of his work in the movie where I'm like, yeah, I, I let him make a choice where I'm like, you know what, man, it's your character. You're crafting it. Do your thing. And he would really come out with some stuff that was like touching and amazing in the movie. And again, you know, look, because I was told this was the final Friday, you know, it's in yeah. the type. Um, I wanted to make it a bookend with the original film. So the first movie is ostensibly the story of a woman who loses her son. I wanted the last movie to be about a father who finds his daughter and kind of bookend the movie, the movies that way, you know, give it actually some sense of um, not just shape, but there, I wanted there to be, I wanted people to have a feeling at the end of this movie. And here's the thing, like the cool thing about part one, as dopey as those characters are, there, there's some really good work in that movie from an acting standpoint, and you care about those people when they disappear in the movie. By the way, part two, I think, is the best at that. Part two, every time somebody's gone, you kind of give a shit because you, you're you invested, and the actors are so good in that movie. And Adam, Steve, Miner, Steve Miner's a good director. I mean, I still, I'm still worried about, you know, Paul from part two. I don't even know what happened to him. He's still drinking. He's at the bar right now. He is no, literally... No, no, that, not, Still not drunk. Him. Not him. That, that guy got away, but I'm talking about the main oh. guy at the end that you don't know if he lived or died, you know? And, and dude, I mean, I'm sorry. Is there any any final girl as badass as Amy Steele? Come on. Well, she's Jessie smart. Not, I mean, her whole character is genius. She uses she's a psychological so advantage. She, she was the best. And, and sure. by the way, she also looks like a girl who actually you would grow up next door to. Like, she's really the girl next door. Oh, yeah, she'd be doing the double dutch rope with the other yeah. girl next door and then just yeah. making me look like an ass. Yeah, for sure. That, big, that whole plot line from the remake came from her portrayal, yep. you know, uh, in, in part two. Yep. Um, so, yeah, she's, she's definitely the top 
probably the top final girl there. I mean, so I wanted I wanted Jason Goes to Hell to have characters that you gave a shit about, so that when they would die, when they would get dispatched from the film, you actually were like, oh shit, I like that. Like, I'm sorry for my money, and and, and you know, she I never feel like she gets her her fair due, but Allison Smith, the Vicky character, I mean. I will put her up against any woman in any of the Friday 13ths. She is such a badass. She's so sweet. And when when that shotgun comes out and she's like, fuck this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She No, she's a badass. And also, I had a sp- very specific question about her. Yeah. Now, okay, so I don't know how Crystal Lake, uh, the town itself, is doing for, like, CSI. I don't know if they're hurting budget-wise. <laughs> how come she's scrubbing the blood out of the carpet out of, uh, you know, where Aaron, you know, Aaron had just died. So she took it upon herself to clean a crime scene? I mean... Well, here's why. There's there's a reason. <laughs> there is a reason. Okay? <laughs> she goes over there, and it's the sheriff who has... who won't let anybody else touch the crime scene because that's his girlfriend. Mm. And he's there cleaning it and sobbing. And she comes in and moves him out and says, you don't got to do this. Okay. So that was, that was the logic behind it. There was a character reason why we did that. Okay. Um, she was also Jessica's best friend growing up. So she was entrenched in all that drama. Yes. And she was actually trying to do something nice for Sheriff Landis. That was the she, she could have easily been, and I like that you said that about her, she could have been the final girl. You yes. could have... You could have she flipped was a it. Badass. She because she had the personality. She was uh, she was not morally ambiguous. You knew that she was a good person, and she yep. definitely had the balls to to stand up to. She stood up to Jason Voorhees. She took a shotgun from the back of the diner, and uh, she pushed those you know Voorhees burger baskets out of the way, and she shot the shit out of him. Okay, and One she died. Two burgers. Yeah, it, and also another thing about that scene, I just I just refreshed on this movie. I you know by the way I've watched that movie like a hundred times because it was one of my favorites growing up. Nice, uh, I just I just rewatched it again. Um, the scene where the uh, the the host of the show is killing her and he's pulling her onto the the pole. Sure. Jason, this yeah, the, this is the first time we see Jason's face actually enjoying his work. Oh yeah, he's 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 loving it. Oh, yeah. I noticed that. I noticed that. I had never seen Jason actually smile and get his eyes wide widened, and he, yeah. he reveled in what he did. That was a good piece of uh, directing. I don't know if you directed her to him to do that, but that was oh, yeah. good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that was she, fantastic. She she did everything she could to protect that little bucket of sunshine. You know, <laughs> she really did. Little she really did. Everybody, of sunshine. I want to hear, I want to see, now that you said the words together, CSI Crystal Lake. It's a great idea. <laughs> Let's do oh it. My God. Let's great do idea. it. Dude, I got to tell you, my, my, um, cause I, I get asked a lot like, oh, if you did another Friday 13th, what would you do? And really what I would do? Cause first off, you know, Creighton Duke didn't die. Yeah. So. Okay. He didn't die. Sweet. Exactly. Okay. You heard it here. Awesome. He, bre- he breathes at the end of that scene. Um, the uh, plus Steve Williams and I are working on a Creighton Duke project together. But oh my god, um, that was one of my questions, by the way. Oh yeah, loved him on Supernatural. Man. But he's because he's the fucking man. He is yeah, the man. Um, we came to interview him for the documentary for for Hearts of Darkness, and um, he came to the door, no joke, no shirt on, with a hot dog and a donut. No, a beer in one hand and a knife in the other. That was sounds like, what, right. What the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> and my team was like, we're here to interview. It's like, ah, I'm fucking with you. Come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> he was a character. <laughs> yes. Stephen Williams is, he is, the re- he is the real deal, man. He is the guy that you see in these movies. But, but, um, my, my dream project would be that uh, Jason is back and a team of bounty hunters led by Creighton Duke with this huge fucking gnarly back brace that he wears because of his broken back. Um, they go after him predator style. Oh my God. Just green light it. Call, call Shane Black right now. Right? Let's get it. Adam Marcus Shane Black production. 
you've got an expanse of woods out okay. in Jersey, just endless. And these guys have to go after it, go into those woods. It's it's basically like, how do you take like Predator, Bigfoot, and a Friday the 13th movie, shove them together? That's, and that's the movie. Money. Take my money. That uh, definitely. <laughs> when I first saw uh, him and uh, Steven in the, the first film I ever saw was actually the Blues Brothers, where he's one of the police officers oh. chasing Jake and Elwood, and he's like, "I'm gonna get that son of a bitch." <laughs> I I love. Man. Yeah, he's he has. So freaking good. He, has, he has like six minutes of screen time in that entire. You know, Blues Brothers is like five and a half hours long. So. Uh, <laughs> You know, I was I didn't we didn't even have enough money when I was a kid to rent all of Blues Brothers because it came on like five VHS tapes. Right. But you know, when Steven came on screen, I was mesmerized because every scene he's in, like when they're driving through the mall and there's a Miss Piggy getting thrown all over the place, he steals every scene of that yeah. movie. Yeah. Well, look, there's a reason this guy guys, think about it. He's working to this day. He's working on like five shows right now. He was in uh, the. He was in it, uh, which also was another New Line Cinema production. I thought. I wonder. I was like, is he a New Line player for like this from guy, this way guy back? Just he is so talented, and he is one he of is. those guys that look. Um, I, I. I. One of the things that I that I've done in Los Angeles since since Jason goes to hell. I um because I started my career back in New York in, in theater, and I I've, I've been teaching acting since I was 15 years old, and so I started a company out in L.A. And one of the things that I always have my actors do is I always tell them, go rewatch The Outsiders. Okay? Now, The Outsiders is nothing but a cast of huge stars, of people who all were stars or became stars after that movie. But I tell them to fi fixate on one scene in particular. There's a scene where they're all in the kitchen, and it's all the guys, right? And somebody comes into the kitchen, opens up the fridge, pulls out a piece of chocolate cake. Not a chocolate cake, but an actual slice of chocolate cake and eats it with their hand while talking in the scene, right? But I say, in that scene, I want you to see who it is that takes the focus from this room of stars. It's nobody but stars. It's Swayze, it's Rob Lowe, it's Ralph Macchio. They're all in this scene, but there's one guy who steals focus. Yeah, it's Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise literally eats their lunch. And you're like, the one guy in that room that's been a movie star from that movie till today, and I mean a box office blockbuster movie star, yeah. is the guy who could steal your focus from a bunch of other movie stars. Stephen Williams has that kind of magnetism. He does. You can't, you can't help look at the guy. You're like, who is that dude? You know why? Because he's nuts. <laughs> Is that the secret? That's is wait. It... That's totally the secret. Okay. Have, look, here's the thing. Watch. Go back and watch like the original Lethal Weapon. Right. Murtaugh. Um. Right? Yeah. Right. Um, Riggs. Thing, you go back. You go back and watch the original Lethal Weapon or any of the original Mad Max movies, and you see in Mel Gibson's eyes, you see that crazy. Yeah. He's crazy. Crazy is great as long as you're not an asshole after the camera stop stop rolling. If you're a dick, well, then your career is going to hit a hit a wall. And alcoholism is a terrible way to hit that wall. But guys, Daniel Day Lewis, like I love when actors are like, I want to do what Daniel Day Lewis does. I'm like, well, okay, maybe you should live six months in a mental ward, and then maybe you can get close to what Daniel Day Lewis does because he's fucking nuts. But that's his genius. That's the mm. magic of it. So, yeah, there are some people who are, you know, look, I mean, Meryl Streep, who I've only met a couple times, is, like, one of the nicest women I've ever known. Like, she's just, she's a doll, and she's really freaking funny. And I keep looking at her, like, when is the crazy going to pop out? It just doesn't. <laughs> she's not nuts. And I'm like, you're not nuts. You, like, you drive a Volvo. You live in Connecticut. You're not <laughs> nuts. Like, <laughs> where's all that genius, man? Meryl Streep, uh, this is totally off topic, but I'm glad you brought her up because I love Julie and Julia. But yeah. another but another movie that I love of Meryl Streep that not a lot of people like or have seen or even remember, I love her in She Devil. I love her as oh, the dude, author. Dude, she's amazing. She yeah, she steals Ed Begley Jr. 
She's so she's sleeping with the butler before Ed Begley Jr. shows up. She's got she's trying to yeah. do laundry. That scene yeah. where she's trying to do laundry because she doesn't have any kids is hilarious. Yeah. She is phenomenal in that movie. She's amazing. That comes or... I, think, I think that movie was sort of like her warm up to do the Double Wears Prada. Oh, oh, she was basically mm -hmm. a very similar character. Right. 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 Yes. Yes. I would have liked to have seen Death Becomes Her made nowadays because it was so ahead. I think it was ahead of its time. They are like, remaking it. They're oh, remaking oh, really? it. Really? Okay. Yeah, Bruce that's, Willis that's, could play the same character again. He could be I the same Death guy. Death Becomes Him, probably, uh, if it's a well, remake. Bruce Willis, Bruce Willis is one of those guys, actually, kind of like myself. But Bruce Willis, is uh, he's been middle-aged his entire life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of like me. Like when I was 15, people were like, you're 40, right? I'm like, no, I'm 15. <laughs> you're like, no, actually, I'm the youngest director to ever be hired by New Line Cinema uh, at the time. It's true. It's hey, true. I was going to, Adam, I was going to ask you a question about that. So when, um, you know, Bob Shea was off on sabbatical overseas and then you yeah. get hired and the film gets greenlit to be made. Well, no, did I you know about it. Bob, Bob, no, Bob Shea hired me. Okay. 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 Yeah, Bob Shea okay. hired me. He left months later. But no, I actually had to, uh, Sean Cunningham brought me to New Line, right? And brought me into the office with Bob, with Bob Shea and Mike DeLuca. I had already met Mike DeLuca and Mike, Mike was already a fan. Mike and I had already gotten along. So I go in with Mike DeLuca into this office that is Bob Shea's office. And truly there is Freddy shit everywhere. Like it's, it is the house that Freddy built, right? And I sit across from Bob Shea and I'm not kidding you. Bob Shea gives me an oral horror movie quiz. That was literally, he like starts grilling me about horror movies. And I have um, sort of a didactic memory, especially for movie posters. And he literally starts trying to grill me on his movies. Okay. And I'm reading the credits on the bottom of the posters in my head. And I'm like, oh, Bob, wasn't that your second film? You, you, you were, uh, yeah, that was your second film you produced. He's like, huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. huh. I like the cut of his jib. All he of his films are chronologically positioned right in front right. of Adam's eyes. <laughs> he, turns to, he turns to Sean Cunningham and he says, he says, yeah, he doesn't suck. Oh, shit. <laughs> And wow. Mike, uh, Mike DeLuca is then told, uh, take Adam uh, outside to the to, uh, to wait. And Mike DeLuca takes me out, close the door. He's like, <laughs> like, he doesn't suck. That's, he's like, Adam, that's the best compliment you're ever going to get from Bob. Wow. I'm that's like, a, that's no. amazing. And then a week later, I had to shoot a director's test. And I shot the scene um, with the, with Officer Randy and Steven having the fight outside the cop car, because we could shoot that during daylight hours and I could make it work. But I shot on 35. I had already hired my whole crew. So my cinematographer, everybody came out and shot that scene for me because they were like, yeah, we want Adam to get the job. So we awesome. shot that scene, sent it, I, I cut it over the weekend. Again, guys, this is on 35 millimeter. This wasn't like video editing. This was like, I'm, I had to cut this fucking thing. And um, Harry Manfredini came in and scored the three-minute scene. And we sent it to Bob Shea. And the next morning, they were like, he's hired. He's the guy. That's phenomenal. And, you know, Manfredini coming back for your movie was a big, big deal. Yeah. Because J Jason Takes Manhattan, Manfredini's like, I'm working on a movie of the week for ABC. I don't got time for this shitter. Like, and yeah. then that says a lot that he... You know, he must have liked the script. He must have liked everything because he was he was passing on a bunch of those. Well, yeah. here's the thing, Harry. Harry's been like an uncle to me my whole life. He's Uncle Heshi, um, and uh, he's amazing. Like, yeah, he is. He's amazing, and he's a he's just a sweetheart. Like I love the guy, and so it wasn't even it wasn't even a discussion. It was like you know, I walked in, Sean. I said, "We're gonna get Harry, right?" He's like, "Oh, absolutely, yeah, huh? I'll call him." <laughs> up there. Um, and, so Next thing you know, we had him. So yeah, he he jumped back in. Did and Harry? Then, as, oh, oh sorry. sorry, Josh. No, I was gonna. This is a quick question. Did Harry do the the signature sound of like the Jason sound for yeah. the sound? Okay, so he did that. That's what ev anybody that I talk to that isn't a horror person knows that sound from Jason yeah. Goes to Hell. Everybody knows that sound. They might not even know the movie, but they remember that. That's him. 
Yeah, I gotta, I gotta say, you had some of the best kills in the series. Uh, the tent, uh, that 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 kill, the guy getting <laughs> that one's sweet. Um, Thanks, dude. Alex. But that's but that's because look, that's because um, I I work with uh, with Can Be so meticulously. I mean, I was never in my office at Cunningham Productions one because I didn't want to be around Sean because he was horrible. Um, but more because I, I've always been a makeup geek. Like that's, that's always been the thing that I like most fascinated about when it comes to horror movies. And, you know, look, I met Tom Savini when I was 11. Um, wow. I, I met Dick Smith when I was yes. 13, changed my life. Um, and then there was a guy named Andy Clement who, when I, about the same time, about when I was 13, I started learning makeup effects from, and he was a few years older than me. He lived in the town next to mine. He lived in Norwalk. I was in Westport. But he came in to do special makeup effects for our theater company. And he started teaching me this stuff. And I was like, I really want to learn all of this. He's like, all right, I'll teach you. Like, I'm happy to teach you. And he and I became really good friends. We're friends to this day. Andy Clement runs a company called Creative Character Engineering. That's his company. And he now runs the Dick Smith School. Wow. And Andy is the guy who did Deadpool. He oh, does wow. all the DC shows, all the costumes, all those like those vacuum form costumes. He is like one of the top makeup effects guys in Los Angeles. And I mean, that's where my heart was. So, when, and by the way, Andy had worked for KNB the year before I ended up working with KNB. But Bob Kurtzman, the guy's like my brother. And I mean, we we do everything together. Like I fucking adore that guy. And here's the thing: he was also the second unit director on Jason Goes to Hell, because my sense was, look, there are going to be effects that I have to shoot, and this guy's going to know how to shoot them better than anybody else. So if you've got, you know, Bob Kurtzman and Howard Berger as your as the main focus of the effects on your movie, and Greg Nicotero's doing like the paint jobs on stuff, you're like. I mean, you have the best of the best of the that best. Is, that's mm -hmm. the best. So these guys were incredible. And Kurtzman, I mean, dude, Kurtzman just did Secret Santa with me. And we're about to go overseas and shoot a new movie. So, I mean, no, Kurtzman, I had great effects because I was at the, I was at the makeup effect shop more time than I was anywhere else during this movie. Yeah. Um, so, so much so, I have a jacket, I have a crew jacket in my, in my, uh, my, closet right there uh from the KMB guys and they're like we don't give these to directors but you're really a part of the makeup team on this movie that's awesome the, cool. the, the detail is great man uh it really okay. is uh i want to talk about um you know secret santa I don't, yeah. I don't know how much time you got we got all the time i'm okay i'm okay we can keep going okay um there's two more things i know that alex something alex wanted to bring up about jason goes to hell and the Wait. question i had and uh, that's it for me. Uh, Alex, I'm going to ask mine, and then I'm going to give you that one that you uh, – I know what, I know you've been waiting to ask it, so I'm going to make mine really quick here. Okay. Um, Jason talking. Yeah. Only recently has this become – like people noticed it. I'm like, it's been in the movie the whole time. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, re just here recently in the past few years, people have been making a big deal about it. Uh, was it a big deal when you, when you wrote it? I mean – Completely not a big deal. Um, I will tell you, I shouldn't have done it. It's the one thing in Jason Goes to Hell that I go, eh, I fucked my own rules. I, look, okay. I am, I, I, my only problem with any horror movie and horror movie logic, if a horror movie stays within its own logic, you're good to go. I don't care how ridiculous it gets, as long as it's part of the logic of the movie, fair game. The one thing I did in Jason Goes to Hell that if I could take it back, I would, is that one fucking line. And it's my brother, Kip, who says it. Get away from her, Ed. Yeah, that's Kip. That's Kip Martin. That's his brother. And Man, uh, I totally, totally slipped that. That totally slipped by me. Oh get the God. hell away from her, Ed, is what yeah, he says, Get the right? hell away from her, Ed. Yeah, I was going to say, Kip, uh, I had a question about Kip and you, actually. You guys are playing deputies in uh, Crystal Lake. You're both yeah. deputies, okay? You're checking people in. Kip's out there working his ass off, trying to get his best friend off a murder case. Yep. Uh, you know, I very believable. Kip does a, gr Kip does a great job, actually. My okay. biggest concern that kind of took me out of the movie, it. though. Yes. 
Kip's hair and your hair, I don't know that any police officers would be allowed to have those locks. What do you think? Is that now? That's the one thing. Zombies, Necronomicon, all that. I'm buy it all. All right, I buy it all. Your guys' haircuts and deputies. I don't know. My hair isn't too bad in that movie. And again, I think um, and like Mark and Brian are also in that sequence as cops. Oh yeah. So my hair and Brian's hair were about the same length. So I was like, all right, we're kind of okay there. (laughs) Kip's no Kip. Look, here's the thing. Kip's is long. (laughs) Yes. Kip, at that point in Kip's career, he really wanted to be John Turturro. Oh, hey. He's like his hero. And I, and I was sort of indulging it, but I was like, that is a lot of hair, dude. Like, he has got, <laughs> he's got some crazy-ass early 90s hair. Um, yeah, you're not wrong. It's a lot of hair, dude. <laughs> I just, I Kip, Kip, the, oh, and then the other thing that I was thinking about Kip, uh, so Kip, the, the, the sheriff sends Kip mm-hmm. to, uh, to go get the murder suspect. He sends him out there by himself. Uh, and then the sheriff's going to stay back at the, at the police station. So, and then also the other scene with Kip is where Kip puts his hand on the shoulder of Creighton Duke. And he's yeah. like, all right, come on, you're coming with me. Get the hell out. And Creighton Duke can literally kill any, oh, a, a grizzly bear. Half. Yeah, Creighton Duke. brother in half. Yeah, and it, oh, and then the the other question. I don't know what. Listen, I don't know. I've seen this movie a thousand times. I love this movie. We used to rent Jason Goes to Hell. My brother and I. A big thing for my brother and I. If we if uh, if we were good, we would get to go to the video store and we would get five dollars, and you could rent five VHS tapes for five days for five bucks. Yep. Jason Goes to Hell was in the rotation weekly. I'm telling you, because back then you couldn't buy Jason Goes to Hell because it was fifty nine right. ninety nine or something. Expensive. And it had hell in yeah. the title, so it was cool as a kid, you know? Oh, like, yeah. My mom, you know, my mom being a old school Seventh-day Adventist was like, oh, uh, what is this title with hell? What, what is this in here? Uh, well, you know, what do you expect? Jason Goes to Heaven? <laughs> it, had the, it had the 3D box where the, where the, the mask oh, yes. was pushed out from the oh, box. Yeah. So it all, yes. yes it's good. It's good. Oh. Jason Goes to Hell uh, is a fantastic movie because it tells you backstory. It clears up plot points that that weren't there before. I had no idea why Jason was what he did or was who he was. I didn't know why he did what he did. Uh, it did add, Most of the movies were just, I mean, just a, they were trying to make a profit. And I think with what you did was you tried to clear up a lot of the questions that the core audience, which coincidentally, a lot of the core audience who you were marketing the movie to, uh, didn't originally like the film, which is really weird because they should have loved it. Here's the thing. Jason Goes to Hell is sort of like, um, it's what I say now about things like The Witch, where I go, this is why horror movie ha- fans can't have nice things. <laughs> because like people go out on a limb, like the horror community is always saying, we want original voices, we want original things, we want new things. Yeah, and then be you yourself, and be original. Right, and they you do something new and original, and they go, the fuck? Why isn't this the hockey mask and just chopping up teenagers? I don't want to know the mythology. Why are you telling me? Well, you were asking for new. That's every page of Fangoria is some letter. Why is this so boring? Why is it the same thing over and over again? And I'm like, because cause you don't demand better. <laughs> Some of it is people just jumping on the bandwagon. Yes. <clears throat> they want to fit in. So they just say, oh, well, Jason goes to hell and Jason X. Those suck. You know, it's Here's like, no, you didn't even take the time to watch it. I guarantee it. You know, when the, when, <clears throat> when the movies first came out, right, when they first came out, we were number two at the box office because The Fugitive had just come out. So there was no way we were beating The Fugitive. By the way, uh, uh, My Boyfriend's Back came out literally the week before Jason goes to hell. Yeah, so I, I knew it was on two subsequent Fridays. Wow, you were the man of Hollywood for crazy. yeah, a crazy. solid couple months there. So I rented so, that when it first came out. So we came out. So we came in number two, right? The movie made way more money than than Part A had made, so they were yeah. thrilled about that. We made the movie for nothing. I made the movie for two and a half million dollars. It was nothing compared to the other Fridays. It was like we took a way less amount of money and delivered way more to the screen. So all of that happened. When the film first happened, guys, you have to remember, every screening of that movie ended with people jumping out of their seats and cheering and applauding 
Because the final yeah. shot of that movie, right, the final shot of that movie is like, <clears throat> holy fuck, yeah. right? Okay, so all of that happened. There was no internet, guys. The internet was in, in, in its early infancy. There was no YouTube. There was none of that. Then a decade goes by, and suddenly there's an internet, and then there's YouTube, and then there's that guy who does that video how New Line destroyed the Friday the 13th franchise. And literally, that's the moment when I start getting hate mail and people wishing me cancer and threatening me and all of this stuff. It happens right then. And now it's turning around. You know, it it's bad. It really is, and it's awesome. I love it, yeah. Like, I, I, I caught flack early on from a couple people uh, I posted something about Jason Goes to Hell, and they're like, why are you talking about that? And they're like, all my people in my group like jumped on there and defended the movie with me. And I was like, hell yeah, two against like a hundred, you know? I love it. Um, I love it. Look, here's the thing. It's, uh, for, you know, for years, uh, people were asking me to make a documentary about the movie, right? And it went on forever and ever. And my response to it was, I don't know. I don't know if there's enough interest in that. There's some great stories to tell. There's definitely a lot of shit that went down, but I don't know. And it wasn't until um, a, about a year and a half ago, on my birthday, uh, two guys made, um, uh, TJ Bowser and, uh, and uh, Corey Hoffman, the two of them made a, um, uh, a fan page for the movie for my birthday. Like, just as like, like a present to me, right? They're just being sweet. That's awesome. And that is, that's freaking it, awesome. And at first I was like, oh, that's really sweet. How nice. Within days, we had a thousand members. I was like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> Holy crap. And the thing is going strong to this day. And I was like, wow, all right, maybe I should make this freaking documentary. So we go on to Indiegogo to, 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 cause I said, look, if I'm gonna make a documentary, I'm not having my company come out of pocket for it. If the fans want it, they'll pay for it. They'll pay to make the movie happen. Like overnight, they paid for. I was like, "What the hell? The campaign is still up, dude. It's still yeah. we're still getting donations." I'm like, That's "Okay, awesome. great." <laughs> You're like, "I'm gonna start adding some more explosions and car no, chases." To dude, it. seriously, I've been adding animations to it because <laughs> people have been putting money. I'm like, "Great," and and again, because we're in COVID, I can't do anything else. So, oh, um, so yeah, no, it's 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 incredible. And again, look. As, as time has gone on, here's the thing. I never bash someone for bashing my movie. I don't do it, okay? I know there's a lot of filmmakers that do, and I understand where they're coming from because there is a certain sense of, wow, you yeah, know, let's see. No. well, I'm out there making something, <laughs> yeah. and you're in your mom's basement bitching about it. <laughs> I know, for sure. No, Adam, you're 100% correct right. about that. Right. You are. But here's the thing. I also have respect for people's opinion on a film. And my response to it is, hey, man, it's not for everybody. I get it. I tried to make it for the fans. I, I'm a fan. I wanted to make a movie that I would want to see. So that's what I was trying to do. But I understand if you don't like it. And here's what happens. I start to take them down the rabbit hole of the movie. And I go, okay, tell me what it is you don't like. Well, there's not enough hockey mask. Okay, I hear you. Um, did you know that actual screen time of the hockey mask in my movie is actually more than almost all the other films? I don't care. That whole, that whole demon worm thing, what the fuck is that? I totally hear you. Got it. Got it. You don't like the body hopping. Yeah, it's just like the fucking hidden. You ripped off the hidden. Well, I would have ripped off the hidden had I seen the hidden before I made the movie, but I hadn't. But all respect, I get it. Did you like the kills? Yeah, no, they're badass. And like the tent, like the tent kill? Oh, it's like one of the best in the whole series. Okay, cool. Oh, good. Good, good, good. That's like one of your favorites? Oh, yeah, yeah. And that girl was hot. She's hot. I said, oh, so you like the, the girl? You like the other characters? Yeah, yeah. Like the diner people? Oh, shit, they were funny. Like they were like the people from part five, but funnier. Cool. Great. Um, did you, li did you like the, the, the hero of the movie? You thought Steven was good? Yeah, no, he was kind of cool. He's, he's a cool dude. I, I get it. Okay, cool. Do you like when the guy melted? Do you like the whole melty man thing? Yeah, it was badass. It was fucking badass. It should be bad. Okay, all right. So what I'm hearing 
<laughs> is that because I blew Jason up and there's not enough hockey mask in the movie, you're upset. Because Jason is in the movie all the way through. He's just wearing other people's skins like someone else would wear a suit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and did you like when I brought him back at the end? It was badass. Fucking awesome. And the whole fight outside that. Oh, it was epic. Uh-huh. <laughs> did you like the last shot where the glove comes up, pulls the mask down? Yo, it was fucking, what are you kidding? We didn't have, Jay we didn't have Freddy versus Jason. Okay. You still hate the movie? <laughs> right? Right? Exactly. You don't want to stick to hating the movie? Uh, <laughs> and that's the Adam, thing. You can imagine I get hell for this. My top three favorite Jason movies are Jason Goes to Hell, Jason X, and Friday the 13th Part 5. Um, wow. Yes, because you get hell. You I get, get a lot of hell. Yes. Uh, but I'm, I'm okay with that because the thing is, Jason goes to hell. Jason X, they took they they took the story somewhere. They did something different. And at the core of both movies, you have the formula for what a Friday the Thirteenth movie is. But it's got creativity on top of it. It's not a I cookie cutter. And part it. five, I thought had some great kills, and uh, it it was it was well, pretty entertaining. You yeah. know what's great about part five? Part five is really good. And here's why part five is so, sort of awesome, and why I think it's also gaining an audience. You know, for a while, people made fun of that movie because it was directed by a guy who did porn, right? Which is really hilarious since Sean Cunningham started his career doing porn, okay? Noel Cunningham played Marilyn Chambers' love child in Sean's first movie. That's the truth. Sean Cunningham discovered Marilyn Chambers, by the way, also grew up in Westport, Connecticut, alongside me. Um <laughs> <laughs> so, so Not Sean dropping the a photographer too. Like, I love when people like try to skip over that detail. Him and Wes, and you know, like there was a lot of porn in the in the in, porn, in, the, in the backgrounds of a lot of directors. Stallone right? did porn. It was Stallone was the, did porno. Stallion, hundred percent. He yeah. absolutely did porno, and it just yeah. gets kind of gets swept under the rug. Yeah, and again, in the seventies, it didn't have the same. There wasn't the same vibe around it. And Deep Throat, if everybody remembers, was in all the theaters in people's little hometowns. <laughs> so here's the thing. I think the fact that that movie is directed by the director it had, there's something a little dirty about the movie. And I don't mean dirty in like a, a booby way. I mean dirty in that it has dirt under its fingernails. There's something like angry in that film and a little sleazy. And I'm sorry, that's fun. Yeah. That it's fun because it's got I, something. I, yeah. I, I can't I can't put my finger on it, but part five is just I, I love the movie. It, yep. it pulls me in and it keeps me. I can watch it over and over like I can I these. Um, the, scene, you know. the, the scene from part five that stands out to me the most was the scene where the girl who coincidentally her last name is Voorhees. So you know yep. she was abs yeah she was absolutely stacked. Probably one of the hottest girls in the history of Friday the Thirteenth yep. franchise. Yep. Her boyfriend that she's sneaking out in the woods with to sleep with, he gets that belt around his oh, eyes, oh, and he and they like tie it, and it snaps. That's the that's one of the worst kills ever. <laughs> it's hideous, hideous. Jason should have been. De De Deborah, love that you said that. Uh, Deborah is uh, is a good friend. Um, Deborah and I have been friends for years, and my wife, my wife Deborah, uh, just was in the movie that Deborah directed out in New Mexico last year of Thirteen Fanboys. Oh, phenomenal. Yeah. We're going to have to Kate check that out. And all, the, all the Friday folks. So, yeah, De Deb is... I can't wait oh, to see Oh, by the way, Deb is also in my uh, in the documentary. Oh, oh cool. Very yeah, cool. She did a shout-out for the channel, too. She's on the montage that you're on, too. Uh, she's she's right. really cool. Deborah's she's, really cool. We bring her on and interview her, too. She's she's an, she's really... she's she's really She was really busy with uh, 13 Fanboy. I cannot wait to see that. Um, I gotta say, I, I don't know if Alex is gonna ask it. I keep waiting for him to ask it, so I'm gonna just ask it. Wait a minute. Um, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Are you, uh, you can do it. Well, I had a question that I want. I had a question with a punchline that I want to hit Adam with. But I, you go ahead. You go I ahead. I was just gonna ask if Jason has something against facial hair, and leave it at that. Oh God, the homoerotic shaving. <laughs> that that's Alex wanted to ask about that, and uh, that scene, like, is yeah. it? 
Because Jason specifically, I don't know where he learned how to do a straight edge. He could make a very decent living if he can do a straight edge like oh, that. Who would go? Who would go? Well, he's quite, he's not talking very much. The only thing he'd say is, get the hell away from the straight edge, Ed. <laughs> he would say that. It's true. It's the only thing he would say. Yeah, that's all he would say. Um, the, again, look, the scene, that scene is in the movie because, here's the thing. All right. We're in the ninth Friday the Thirteenth, right? And porn's everywhere, right? Right. Okay. And here's the thing, here's the thing, okay? Because being that it's the ninth movie, there comes a point when, as a director, I was like, okay, I've got all these great kills in the movie. I've got a lot of splatter. Awesome. But after a while, you go like, okay, so you killed someone again. How scary is it? It's not very scary, okay? Okay. My audience. There's a lot of women, ton of women, which most people don't think about, but there's usually more women in a horror audience than men. But it's straight white dudes. That's who goes to see Friday the 13th movies, especially at that time. And my sense was, I want every guy in the theater to be squirming out of their skin. <laughs> what better way to do that than to have a big, handsome, burly black dude shaving you down naked <laughs> and then kissing you. <laughs> the, Adam, the, the part, I, I, I like your thinking, the part that Best made answer. me the most, uh, he couldn't do anything. He's literally tied with belts or whatever straps to this oh, yeah. bed. He can't do anything. Nothing. He's screwed. Nothing. Yeah, and that was the part. My favorite thing, is, you know, it's Andy Block who's tied to the table. So I didn't even get like a hot guy I got like a punch balding <laughs> middle aged dude. Like a DMV instructor to like play this role. <laughs> and by the way, like you I, also, I got like a, an award winning actor. The guy's amazing. I've got Richard Gant, who's a fucking genius. I've got these two totally amazing actors having to reenact that scene. You gotta be kidding. Like, we, do you What's know how motivation? Acting on set? <laughs> <laughs> Richard Gant. Richard Gant. Uh, Rocky Five. Uh, he steals. He steal. He's Stephen Williams in that movie. Yes, do you he like is. reaching in your pocket and only feeling your leg? Well, do you? Like yep. he's good. He's, he's I, great. He's, he's an great. asshole, and I and love again, it. And another guy who's working to this day. He's yeah. still working all the time. Yeah. He and he he took some of that um, death becomes her uh, formula because he looks great still, and so does Stephen Williams. By great. the way, he looks great. Yep. One. You know, one thing about the movie, if we're going to talk about questions about the actual story, yeah. why was uh, her body still under the house? Well, because because Robert had stolen her body from the morgue so, and hit it. There. That's right. Got it. Yeah, he's, got he's, it, got talking, it. To, he's it. talking to the person. He's talking to, like, his producer on the telephone. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. The, the, yeah. The, yeah. And yeah. that's yeah. the kind of phone calls I had when I worked at Fox Sports Radio. I would talk to the host. And I'd be like, hey, I just got, you know, this baseball player's, you know, head. So we're, I, we're going to bring it up on the show. So right. that's how you get ratings, Josh. You didn't know that? You steal famous people's bodies all the time. Yeah, uh, I like, that's just I something like, in the uh, business we do. You didn't know I that? I like the rebirth, you know, <laughs> especially that Jason came out in his clothing. Uh, <laughs> well, by the way, no, I like that. I yeah. liked it. Here's the thing. I love when people ask, like, why did Jason come back? when he was reborn, why did he come back as the self that had got blown up? And my response to that is very clear. Remember, he was trying to go through the baby. He was trying to be reborn through a live Voorhees baby, yeah. right? If he had done that, he would have come out as a baby, as yeah. the hydrocephalic headed little Jason, because he came through a dead woman. That's why I like he came it. came back <laughs> out in his dead form. That's perfect. Exactly. That's perfect, and, That's and it shouldn't even have. That doesn't even need to be explained. That is. Yeah, a I wasn't being That's sarcastic. No, 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 no. I really meant. I, get it. I like that. <laughs> I get Josh, it. It Josh, you're giving sense. Adam direction. You're calling him out on his on his plot choices. You know what, Josh? That's the you first mean, time I've done it. You've done it like seven. I times. haven't said no. I asked. I asked Adam. I said, "Sir, I have a question for you. I respect you. Thank you for this helping is, my childhood be better. You're I'm being funny, a this dick. Is most, yeah. This is the most fun I've had in weeks. So well done." <laughs> You never played Jason Goes to Hell on the playground in third grade. You know, busy. I have. Listen, I was but I also Sa played Ernest Goes to Jail, so I don't get too much credit, okay? Oh we played that, wow. too. Wow. Yeah. 
So, I mean. You know who would have been good in uh, Joey B's diner? That was last week. Huh? Freaking Jim Varney could have played the part of the, other, <laughs> of the other cook. He would have knocked it out of the park, man. He would have been great. Yeah, Jim Varney and Rim Shot. Jim Varney could be in Joey B's. I don't know if Jim Varney would have uh, agreed with Adam to have his head be in a deep fryer and then be freaking shot put it on a flat top you, grill. You, you know, know what I mean, Vern? <laughs> Leslie Jordan is still mad at me because of that. What, he, really? you know, Leslie Jordan is in a is in like a viral commercial right now that's blown up. He's where such he's, a sweetheart, man. Leslie hey, Jordan is, him, man. A, is a name, man. You can sell a television yes. show on Leslie Jordan. I Leslie agree. Is, yes, he yes. was Leslie amazing a, in Lois and Clark: The New Adventures of Superman. If you've never seen him on that show, he was so great. He's on that so show. good. But I will <laughs> tell so you, good. Rusty Schwimmer, who plays Joey B, who again like works all the fucking time. Yeah. Uh, and she lives in Chicago, so people have to go get her to do stuff. Like, she doesn't, she doesn't live in L.A. or New York. She lives in, Ch- in Chi-Town. And that woman, guys, I'm telling you, she's like a sister to me to this day. She is she, such a badass. She's so extraordinary and an amazing actor. But one of the coolest people I've ever known. You had like some. Speaking of Joey B, you, those characters uh, like I've never seen a horror movie that had six or seven character actors. They're not the star of the film, right. but I was left with a bigger impression with most of their scenes than I was with some of John Lemay's scenes. And I'm there's I, nothing against John. John no. was playing the hero, so he yeah. he didn't get a lot of one liners. The hero is so. usually the the hero is usually the most boring character in the movie. He was the guy who the plot moved through. It's like, hey, John's figuring out why the hell this is going on, so let's give exposition to John. You know, like, I had glasses as a kid, and I was insecure about that, and it was cool to see the, the hero of a movie not being the jock, you yep. know, just kind of being the normal guy with the glasses, kind of nerdy, and then kicking Jason's ass, you know. Well, he yeah. gets his ass kicked, too, but he fights Jason and puts on a hell of a fight. Yeah. John was taking he some freaking shit. Yeah, he, John was taking some blows from that rake at the end of the movie. That would have killed yeah. almost anybody else that fought him straight and he's up like not that. Not the superhero guy. You know, that no. was so cool. That is that that's what I love about his portrayal in that movie. Uh, well, look, the other thing, look, is that. My, my my casting behind the movie really stems from the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Okay. And the reasoning I behind that, lie. Right. Like, you look at the people in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that is the most fucked up group of young people ever assembled in a band. Because that's like, real that, life. That's an attractive <laughs> bus of people, right? Yeah. Like, the hot girl is like, wow, that's the hot girl? I mean, <laughs> it's like, right? She's like and, bowling alley hot. Right, she's right, like, right. thanks a lot, yeah. Adam. Oh. But, but, well, she's passed on, but... but, but no, but I'm just... <laughs> here's the thing. Here's the thing. We all put ourselves in the van because of that. Like, we recognize ourselves in those people. When you suddenly cut to Marcus Nispel, who's a lovely guy, he's a great guy, actually, you cut to Marcus Nispel's remake of Texas Chainsaw, and you go, why is everybody out of an Abercrombie at Fitch catalog? Mm -hmm. Like, it it doesn't make sense. People aren't this good looking. Yeah, Jessica Biel and, yeah. Right. And They're again, all... I understand your, your, your final girl being ultra hot. I get it. I get it. I really do. Um, in fact, on Jason Goes to Hell, um, uh, uh, Lori Holden was originally cast to play Jessica. That's who I want. Lori and I had been friends for years. She's been and, on Walking Dead. Like, uh, yeah. No, Lori, guys, Lori was so beautiful, it, you, she could stop traffic. Okay, um, I mean the woman was just like, ah. Oh. I first yeah. saw her on the Shield. That was the first thing I saw her on. She's great on the Shield. But guys, if you go back, if you look back at her when I was casting her, she was in her early twenties. She had already won a bunch of awards in Canada because she was Canadian. She had won a bunch of awards in Canada for playing. I think it was Anna Karenina. Um, oh, wow. So this this girl was a highly trained actor. She was at UCLA at the time, getting her acting degree. She had taken a break from working professionally to get her degree. She and I became really close friends. I auditioned her for the part. Everybody who saw her, including my casting people, were like, she's brilliant. She's your girl. Sean Cunningham wouldn't let me cast her. Oh, my God. He Was he like, she's way too hot? Is that was... Okay. 
I will. Well, now wait. Here's the thing. Mm. But again, in the lead girl, I go, I get it. Like, let that girl be the one that you're like, oh, oh my God. God. Yeah. Right? But then you have to cast everybody else according to that. Yeah. <clears throat> like you know, I never of- thought of it. Yeah. I never thought of it, but Jason goes, like, Crystal Lake in your movie feels like a real town. You know, like, it, it look, there's all these different types of people. It's not it's not cookie cutter and stuff like these other. It, that's I've never really. I mean, I've always thought it was the the choices and casting were it was interesting and and different. But it is. It feels like a real town. Like the people in a. I grew up. I grew up in a small town of less than four hundred people, and it kind of yeah. feels like that. You yeah, know? and that's yeah. the way it was supposed to feel. That's awesome. That's exactly what I was trying to do. Joey yeah. B's Joey B's son, who's like the line cook, and then you know John Lemay's character. Like, in my hometown, I grew up on a small town on the Oregon coast. Uh, you'll have people that have kind of a bit of an age difference, but once you get out of high school, you become friends with people you never thought you'd be friends with. Because, yeah. you know, may- maybe Steven ate at that diner all the time, and he had conversation with Joey's, you know, Joey B's son, and they became friends. So it seemed organic, and it seemed real. Or take it, the keys and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like, hey, yeah. he's all, hey. You you know, guys, by the way, that is, that is my single favorite scene of that movie. I, I love that's why I brought it it's up. Real it's, it's real life. It's real life. When, really when Steven is in the back of the dry storage and he's looking at his baby for the first time, yep. that was perfect casting because he had enough range to be able to emote. I could see it in his facial expressions and his eyes that he was seeing his daughter for the first time. Yep. It, and I, I believed it. I wasn't taken out of the scene. So it yep. was really good. That was a great scene. By the way, the guy who played um, who played Ward, Joey B's kid, is uh, was my childhood friend Adam Craner, who I'd known since I was eight years old. He's is he funny in real life? Because he comes he's across really funny. Yeah, yeah, I could tell. Well, yeah, I could tell that he was work. funny. He's a brilliant guy, and he he was an actor in New York. You know, he had just he had just graduated from Ithaca. I uh, got his acting degree. He wasn't getting any work, and I called him up. I was like, dude. I got this part for you. He's like, Adam, I can't even afford to fly out there. I was like, dude, listen, I'll fly you out. I'll get you a job working security for the stages. So you'll have a job the entire run of the shoot. And then on the days that you're an actor, you hit the stage, you're an actor. And so he had a bedroom. He was the security guard for our whole state, for all the stages. And then would just show up to do his acting and then go back to security. So, so did he actually know how to use a, a firearm then from being the security guard on set? He, he, I think we only had like a little taser for him. That's okay. okay. Did Kane oh, enjoy but... getting to get killed by Jason? <laughs> oh, dude, dude, he had, are you kidding? He, I mean, look, here's the thing anytime you cast in a horror movie, the first thing every actor says is, How do I get killed? <laughs> every actor. It's I mean, Kane character. is such a great Jason, he is just such a great He's Jason. Awesome. He should have been in Freddy vs. Jason. Yeah, I'm think, still pissed about that to this day. Like Adam, yeah. How, how come? Were you asked to do Freddy vs. Jason? Were you ever asked to give a treatment for that? I I did. What happened was you have to remember. Right after Jason goes to hell, I had a three picture deal at New Line. Okay, and they brought me in to pitch for Freddy vs. Jason, and I had a I had a story, and it was a good one. It was really good. So uh, I did my pitch. Right after I did my pitch, Ted Turner bought New Line Cinema. And he killed all the deals with all the horror filmmakers. He didn't want any more horror at New Line. And suddenly they were making Gettysburg. And we were like, what? And so all of the horror people were shown the door. So, guys, remember, and not only that, then Wes Craven came in and said, you know, I'm not really done with Freddy. I want to do this thing, New Nightmare, I've been working on. And that was it. They were like, okay, you can do New Nightmare. And Sean, because he was going to, because the rights to the Jason character were going to revert back to Paramount if they didn't make a new movie. That's why he had to make Jason X. He didn't want to make Jason X. He had no interest in making Jason X. I'm glad he did, though, because I thought I think it was a great movie. Yeah, but he he couldn't. Let's put it this way: he cared so little about that movie that he sent his son to produce it. Okay. His we should have had Freddy versus Jason so much sooner. We really should have. Right. His son, who was the second assistant editor on Jason Goes to Hell, is suddenly the producer of the movie. 
Well, I yeah. Jason X had a was behind the eight ball anyway because the internet had just started with that yeah, torrent sharing it. stuff. Everybody yeah. downloaded that film. It's amazing it even turned a profit, to be honest, yeah. guys. It, yes, it was it the is. first one I saw in theaters, the first Jason movie ever, that I was actually able to go by myself and watch. Right. Uh, but uh, And I was like, how is there not more people here to see it? Jason's back. And then I found out later it had been put on the internet like a year before, and people had already seen it, you know? Yep. And, uh, yeah, yeah. That, was a, it, it, that, it screwed that movie. Look, you know, and guys, I mean, think about it. It took 10 years to go from Jason goes to hell to Freddy versus Jason. And look, here's the thing again, I think Freddy versus Jason has some great stuff in it, but I got to tell you, it's one of those movies that I go, this took 10 years, guys. I know, this. right. It's, uh, uh-uh. Uh, and, they, and Kane not being in it, that pissed me off so bad, man. Well, but Ronnie, and, you, Ronnie, you had never seen a Friday the 13th movie. Ken I, Kersinger is good and everything, but he, eh, much, from eh, what I heard, from eh. what I've heard, he pretty much said, I'm trying to be nice here, okay? He pretty much told them that he played Jason in Takes Manhattan, and all he did was one scene, getting hit by a car, you yeah. know? And he said, oh, it was Jason in Takes Manhattan. You know, I feel like he stole that from Kane, and Kane is just too nice of a guy, you know, to hold a grudge. Kane, so. Kane was pissed. Kane was uh, he, not okay. He wanted, he, he was a big pr- proponent for Freddy versus Jason to get made. He they earned sent, his spot to fight they, Freddy. They sent him, they sent Kane the script. Kane, yeah. Kane, Kane was working under the assumption, yeah, I'm going to get, why, why, on, why on earth would New Line send me the freaking script because he could have leaked it if, if he didn't think he was going to be in the movie he could have been an asshole and just leaked it himself and blew you, the whistle on the whole thing if but you read the I novelization think. and i think alex will agree with this because you've listened to my narration of it it's written like the nuances and stuff that it says like the breeding and stuff it's written, oh, it's kane like it's written for kane yeah. the novelization it's kane when you read it, it yes. it's not it's not kurzinger uh, but yeah, that I, I like I, New Nightmare, I, I, but I hate how New Nightmare ruined like, that for like, us. Like he he should have been he should no one should let, let's put it this way no one should play Freddy and no one should play Jason except those two dudes. That's it. That's it. And the people that came before Kane did a great job. You yeah, know? They're great. But but Kane took what they did and made this is Jason. That's Jason. You know the whole. The way he would just breathe was just was just perfect, and uh, you know, I, like I said, I love New Nightmare. I, I thought it was really it was actually pretty good. But the one thing I had against it is it was one of the main reasons we didn't get Freddy versus Jason Absolutely. sooner. It's and, it's uh, the biggest reason why you didn't get it. Yeah. Well, the New Nightmare for me, and I I am in the minority here. I don't. I it's not one of my top. Elm Street movies. It's not okay. It's fine. It's meta. It's Weird whatever. Guy, remember? Yeah. Okay. Here's the deal. Uh, Freddy's. I don't know if you guys have noticed. Freddy's wearing leather pants. Okay. Freddy's wearing leather pants. Freddy. That's what I like about it. Fre- Freddy's not Freddy. Okay. And if you guys don't, it, Mika, little Mika uh, from yeah. Pet Cemetery, kind of hands Freddy his ass down in that boy down in the the you know, the boiler room. He does. And. Yeah, Freddy is substantially less powerful as this entity, as this demon. Oh, totally. I mean, he, he gets his ass handed to him. Sure. It, it, it takes me out of it. And there I, was I'm a sorry. big thing taken out that was supposed to be in the movie that would have made it more interesting. The babysitter was supposed to be like a uh, being controlled by the Freddy demon thing. And she, she was the one that was being sending the, by him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was the one that was sending the letters and making the phone calls and stuff and that's a big plot hole in the movie that never really gets explained so this demon was sending threatening letters and threatening and making phone calls to nan you know to uh to heather you know it just it doesn't make sense but uh yeah so hey hey adam yeah uh, kane did so when you go were you were when you were on set with kane and kane you know always says that he knows what Jason would do before Jason does it. Mm-hmm. Did he go, did he go up to you, you know, in between scenes and say, Hey, Adam, I feel like Jason would do this in this situation. Yes. What, what do you yes. think about that? Yes. And, and one of the things, look, I, I constantly wanted Kane 
to speak with the people who were playing Jason throughout the movie. There's my question. That's what's going to happen. That's what I was getting at. So that they would have that encyclopedia of movement and understand all of that. Here's the thing. There was one actor who hated that and would not put up with it, which I understand. Look, you're, you're, you're an actor. You're being hired to do your version of what this character is going to do. Um, however, I, I really wanted them to listen to Kane. <laughs> I know what I was trying to do. Yeah. Um, but Stephen Culp was the only one who okay. was not cool with Kane telling him how to act. And Kane's a pretty intimidating force. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? So I think that Steven kind of balked at that. But that's the only person that had a problem with it. And I will tell you, I think Stephen Culp is great in the movie. Like, he's great in the movie. Yeah. And so threatening and awful. And, I mean, it's a really, it's a cool performance. And so, it's, not, it's not a stretch to no, think that, it's you really. Know, you know, it's Jason's taking over their body, so there's probably a little bit of them in there. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it would be a little different. So, it's, it's not too far exactly, from the stretch. Exactly. And, and I tried to, like, kind of work that with Kane a little bit, too. That Andy Block, I want him to move like Jason, but a middle-aged, you know, <laughs> version of that guy. Like, I wanted it to Clean be... Clean-shaven version. Exa- exactly. Um, <laughs> my brother Kip was the most sort of excited to work with Kane because I think Kip was just scared of Kane. Oh, so he was like, whatever he wants me to do, I'm cool. Like, I'll, okay, what do you want? I would Kip, love to Kip, talk with him. Kip was uh, the ultimate uh, Barney Fife-esque deputy. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and on my podcast, I specifically mention your brother because I love uh, my favorite TV show, actually. I'm, I'm not even age-appropriate for this. I love the Andy Griffith show. So Kip kind of has that Don Knotts uh, – esque vibe going throughout the film well, when he puts his arm i've already talked about it earlier in this uh, he the puts show. It on, on yeah when he, when he puts it on Craig duke's shoulder like come on like the only thing kip didn't do was the like the breathing thing right. with his nose right. you know that well kip was and, awesome by the way that shot that shot where he does at the end of it he puts his hand on his shoulder but that whole shot if you'll notice it's an entire lineup of the entire cast of the movie it's this really like I love that yeah. shot, and my my uh, my my roommate from college, a guy named Dave Emmerichs, um, who just won the Lifetime Achievement Award from the uh, Cinematographers uh, Association. Um, he was the Steadicam operator on that shot, and it was amazing because I had told him exactly how I wanted everybody positioned, how I, want, and I'm telling you, like to this day, he's like, it's a badass shot. He's like, it's like one of the first movies he worked on, but he's like. It's a badass shot. I, well, I got to say, for, and this isn't, this isn't just like, uh, you know, uh, platitudes or kissing butt because you're our guest, but like for 22 years old, man, and the way you directed the movie, it, it, it's amazing. It really is. It's, it's a great film. Thank you. And uh, I, was, I, it will forever... I was 23 when I directed that. Oh, 23. It was 23. Yeah. It's yeah. Th- Still, man, you know, that's one birthday. You know, that, that's, that's awesome. I dare any 23-year-old to go out and do something as creative as that. Um, it was know, pretty cool, man. It. it was, you know, it was a hundred person crew and a huge cast and a stunt and a makeup effect every single day of the show. Um, it was, it was a lot. It was Did a lot. Steve was, Williams improv any of his lines or was that all scripted? No, that's written. That's written. All written? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, Josh. He made me think with his acting that, you know, he might have just went with it a couple times. So. Yeah. It's just another testament to how great he is. The one line I will tell you when, uh, right after Jason gets blown up, um, so in the script, he's supposed to be sitting on this hill watching this, right? That there's this mysterious guy who's seen all of this. Yeah. And I walked over, I, like we shot it and I went, it's not right. Like it's not working yet. And I walked over to Steven. I said, Steven, when, you just, when you're looking out over on the, looking at this, can you just say, I don't think so? And he was like, Love that. I was like, cool. And that, I don't think so, is so good. Like, I'm like, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Like, he said it once. was like, cut, moving on. I mean, it was oh, so, wow. like, and even Dean Laurie, who wrote a ton of the dialogue, like, he wrote most of the dialogue in the movie, Dean Laurie t- turns to me and goes, dude, that was badass. <laughs> like, that's the line. I was like, yes, yeah, kind of works. Yeah, that's, that kind of makes the scene, you know, uh, that that sets the tone for what's gonna what's gonna happen uh, for sure. 
The yeah. only thing Stephen Williams doesn't have going for him yeah. is my ex father in law's name is Stephen Williams. And uh, sorry, that kind of ruined it. So kind of, kind of hurts a little bit. I, yeah, I feel you already. Yeah. <laughs> did, did did Dean uh, write the the line the line mango size crap? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And I will uh, tell you. Here's what's funny. That dialogue was not in the original script. Dean brought me that dialogue the day we were shooting that scene because I had told him. I said, "Look, dude, if you want to riff, because Dean's hilarious. It's like if you want to riff, you want to do something." He's like, I, I, "I'll come up with something." He handed me that page that day of just that monologue. And I almost pissed myself as laughing so hard. I was like, listen, I said, I don't know if Sean Cunningham is ever going to let us keep this in the movie, but we're sure as shit going to shoot. <laughs> it's great. It's great. Yeah, that's one of the lines, though, that, like, sticks out to me in the in that movie. Like, and he only had, like, I'm, I'm telling you, he comes in with the pizza. He says the, the line about wanting to take a mango-sized crap. He, you know, he, talking about how he's a maggot-infested maggot fuck. You maggoty blown up <laughs> <laughs> Suck it! Yeah, yeah, no. He, he, that's very good. He's great. He's fantastic. He's great. Well, and by the way, like when he comes in through the door, I literally, <laughs> as he was walking, I, I, I directed him. I said, "Listen," I said, "When they start to pat you down, I said, get the giggles, like let them tickle you." <laughs> like that's fucking. I'm totally doing it. I was like, "Hey, so, <laughs> that's a great acting because that's hard to fake." You know, it's hard to fake uh, getting, you know, the reaction to being tickled. So yep. uh, that's some good acting there. I, hey. I want to jump forward in time a little bit now because uh, I want to talk about Secret Santa, too. Because I, I see this as being a cult classic in, in okay. the pretty near future. Uh, and, you know, I've spread it around a lot. Okay. Uh, it was refreshing, man. It was a great movie. I've seen so much horror in the past, like, ten years. Mm -hmm. And it just... It's the same thing. You know, every movie is just rinse, repeat. You watch the same thing with different characters. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we've seen the zombie trope and everything. Sure. But I don't even consider it really a zombie flick. You know what I mean? It, I don't. It's not a zombie flick. Not, they're it's, not dead. They're, nobody's, nobody's, they're not dead yeah. until they're dead. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's just a great movie, man. Uh, have, have, you've watched it, right, Alex? Uh, I, you know what? I haven't seen all of it. I started watching it today. I no, don't be upset with me. I oh, just I watched Jason Goes to Hell. Nicole was like, I, I listen. I was doing a whole Adam Marcus filmography before we even did this. Not that okay. I needed to watch Jason Goes to Hell again for the thousandth you know time, but I had to. I had to fill oh. myself in. By the I'm way, just, by the know. way, if you're going through the Adam Marcus filmography, uh, crazy thing, and this just happened two weeks ago. So my brother Kip and I, right after I did Jason Goes to Hell, I got offered like a ton of horror movies, right? Everything had a part number. So Pumpkinhead 2, Amityville 97, um, Leprechaun Back 2, Da Hood. Um, oh I mean, God. I got offered, I've been offered three Leprechaun films in my career. Um, I love the Leprechaun films. <laughs> that would have been awesome. I totally respect them, but I've got to tell you, when, when you would read these scripts, you'd be like, oh. Yeah, especially in space, man. It, it's just it's 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 my cheese. It's my totally. go-to bad cheese. For, Ab yeah. Absolutely. I just remember when when the first Leprechaun movie came out. I was in Westwood seeing it at the Fox Theater, uh, and in the middle of the movie, like the audience was just like not feeling it. It was a packed house, and people were like, "What is this?" And in the middle of the movie, I'm in the back row, and I went, "I want me money back." <laughs> <laughs> got the best laugh of the whole night out of the whole oh fucking thing. So <laughs> those movies a, have such a great actor in them. Oh, go ahead. Thing I didn't want to be a filmmaker that every movie I made had a part number at the end of it. Yeah, like I just didn't want to be that guy. So I started writing with my wife Deborah, who at that time wasn't my wife, and we we started selling scripts, which was great, but. I hadn't, got, I hadn't decided what I was going to do behind the camera for my second film. Well, my brother Kip brought me this screenplay based on a play he had written in New York that he had done at the Tribeca Film Center with De Niro and blah, blah, blah. So he brought me this, this screenplay. The screenplay was a mess, but the two of us worked on it for a couple months together. And before you knew it, it was a movie I was like, okay, this is a cool, this is a cool movie. And it's not what anyone is expecting me to do, which was great. And so I made this movie that was originally called Snow Days, which was like 
became a festival hit like overnight was we were we were at Sundance we were at AFI we were at LAIFF we were like all over the place right I'm all, literally all over the world with this movie and the movie Snow Day the Nickelodeon movie came yeah. out oh my god so we had to change our title because everybody was getting our movies confused and it's funny because I called a buddy of mine at Paramount I said dude we had the title first they're like yeah we're Paramount I was like but we have, we've already been at all the festivals. He goes, I know. You guys are awesome because every you guys are getting great reviews and our movie's getting shitty reviews and everybody thinks your reviews are our reviews, so keep going. I was like... Oh, my God. So wow. we changed the movie to Let It Snow. And the movie... I'm telling you, guys, my brother was one of the guys running Amazon streaming, right? Kip it works for Amazon. He has for the last decade. Two weeks ago, I'm looking at the Secret Santa stats because they had sent us a bunch of paperwork because it's on Amazon Prime. And I look and I look and I'm like, wait a second. And it has a button, click to the director's other films and Let It Snow is sitting there. I'm like, when the fuck did this happen? <laughs> My brother runs the service. He didn't know it was there. What? Had no really? idea. We were like, what the fuck? So they just put the movie up like two weeks ago. It's awesome. great. So my like my indie comedy that like won all these awards and got me all this work and everything else. I was like, uh, and it like truly came out of nowhere. Got, by the way, Stephen Colbert is in the movie. It's one of the first movies he ever did. Um, Missy Pyle, who uh, the minute you see her, you'll know who she is. Guys. Yeah. Um, the female alien in Galaxy Quest. That's mm -hmm. Missy. Um, but. Uh, great movie. Uh, Henry Simmons, who's the lead of Shield. Oh yeah, the, the huge black guy, the good, you know, handsome, handsome black dude. This was his first movie. Miriam Shore, um, Bernadette Peters came out of a nine-year retirement from film to do the movie. So like, I had this like incredible cast in this tiny little indie, and it just hit streaming. So again, it's on Amazon Prime, but I, I'm, I'm saying only uh, if people who want to see stuff I've done. I'll it's, watch it when we're done. Yeah, uh, no, we're I'll definitely check gonna out. check that out. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but and Kip, Kip is the lead of it as well. He's the he's the lead of the movie. He's terrific. Um, but here's the thing with Secret Santa, um, you know, after I had done Texas Chainsaw, um, when Deb and I went to see the final cut of the movie at, at at Lionsgate, and by the way, Lionsgate was fucking awesome to work with. Like I love those dudes. We're sitting in the theater. And I'm watching this like weird neutered version of the script that we were hired to write. And suddenly there's a cell phone, a smartphone in the movie. And I'm like, what is this? Who put this in? Oh my goodness. And guys, I mean, the movie takes place in 1993. There's a smartphone in the movie. That's oh ridiculous. Yeah, it's, a, it's supposed to be a direct sequel to the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's... <laughs> Idiot. I got a phone call from Toby Hooper at my home. He called me to say to my wife and I, he's like, Adam, Deborah, I just finished reading your script. I can tell you it is the first true and the single best sequel ever made to my film. And he oh, said, shit. I'm including the movie I wrote and directed. I was like, I turned to Deb. I said, you can put me in a box. Like, I'm done. Like, we're life goals. Done. <laughs> No, that's incredible. That is incredible it that is. he would say that. Saw what they did to the movie. I saw the movie opening night. That was actually uh, a movie that I uh, went to with my girlfriend. Uh, she's not a horror movie person, and she and she enjoyed it, but I she wouldn't have known that uh, right. she wouldn't have known that it wasn't supposed to be in the film. <laughs> that's I can't crazy. They let that slip, but I mean, it, it it doesn't take away from the movie, man. It's Thank a great. You. Thank it's you. It's a great movie. But for and, me. My response to it was, you know, I'm tired of other people making the decisions of what's yeah. in my movies and what's not in my movies. Like, I'm mm -hmm. tired of it. And I'm tired of people who aren't as, um, let's just say, committed to the reality of a project, committed to the logic of a movie. Like, I get the bean counters, and I get, look, when you're working for a studio, they're the boss. And whatever they mm -hmm. say, that's the way it goes. Suck it up. And I always have. But my response to it was, you know what, man? I, I want to do things our way. Like, I want to I make movies that I really believe in, that I know, even if someone hates it, I'll take the hate because it's my choices. I did this. 
And Secret Santa was the first film out of Skeleton Crew, out of our new company. And, and I got to tell you, man, I mean, it's been, um, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. The way people reacting to it, the, the love that it got in the festival world, it was insane. Um, the fact that Fright Fest in London picked it up as their very first title to release, that like, one of the greatest horror film festivals on planet Earth went, this is our favorite. We want to put this as our first release in the UK. Um, that's a pretty spectacular thing to have happen. And it set us up to do a ton of shit. We're, we're doing four different movies this year and a TV series. Um, um, and that's all from this tiny... Guys, I made Secret Santa for so little, you can't buy a new car for what I made that movie. Really? Crap. Yes. Wow. It was written in 21 days. It was shot in 11 nights and one day. Oh, that cast looked like they had a ball, man. They had to have had a ball. You can and just see they're the enjoying actors. making the movie. Those are all my. Those are all my my actors. That's my troop. Those are the people I've been training for years. So that's my family. So I wrote the film for those actors, including my wife Deborah, who's who plays Shari, the the, the head of the family. The, meanest bitch ever put on screen. <laughs> um, and I'm so proud to say it because Deborah could be, Deborah is nothing like the woman she portrays, which shows you how good an actor she is. They like I all. said, it felt like a real family, you know, like a real family get together, dysfunctional and all ends. From the time it starts where, you know, they're in the vehicle and everything, going to it, it's just, it's just perfect flow. Thank and you. Uh, it, it was refreshing because you see so much of the same thing. And uh, you're really gonna you're really gonna enjoy it, Alex. And I can't wait to talk to you about it because uh, it <laughs> if you, it's everything if you, you would. It, oh no no! If you would get a chance to if you get a chance to see the uh, we did a limited edition Blu-ray and and DVD in the movie, and on that DVD and Blu-ray, there's an, uh, a 75 minute documentary on there about the making of the film. That. Is so, like I, I'm so proud of that documentary. I actually I cut the whole thing. I, I'm the guy who put it together. Um, I am as proud of that documentary as I am of the movie I want because see what, the movie what, is this like big fuck you to family, right? Like that's kind of like family is the killer, and the documentary <laughs> is all about the filmmaking family that I have that I love more than anything in this world that made this movie about a fuck you to family. So it's this sort of perfect yin and yang on the disc of like the 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 mean movie and the incredibly nice movie. <laughs> so it's sort of the naughty and nice disc. That's the idea. Okay, that's cool. It kind of reminds me of uh, the way you put it. Like, there's this movie called Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Dude, it's awesome. Yes. Tucker and Dale are evil. Yes, the 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 special feature thing. Yes, it's amazing. <laughs> I would, do you know what's crazy? I was just talking about that yesterday. I was literally talking about Tucker and Dale are evil yesterday. That is, I love, I love how they they shot that. <clears throat> where it makes it really look like they're the bad guy. Yes. Because <laughs> um, that, uh, that's yeah. how it is from the other people's point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's a movie that does not need a sequel, and I hope they never. No. It's no, perfect. No, no. Do not touch it anymore. But I, I do. Uh, but that's because it's not really. It, it had a story and it was told. You know what I mean? And like, I feel like Secret Santa had a story and was told too, but it's obviously that it can continue, you Here's know? The like I, I, feel there's I, more, I feel there's more story left. And, right. Uh, I, want, I want Secret Santa much the way John Carpenter wanted to do Halloween, where it was Tales of Halloween. Oh, okay. He didn't want to do a Michael Myers movie. He hated that they wanted to, he, That's yeah. why he didn't direct part two. It's like, I don't want to do a Michael Myers movie. That's not what I want to do. And it's why he came back to write and produce and do everything else on Halloween 3 because he was like, look, this is kind of what I want to do. I want to do these weird tales of, of, the, of Halloween, which, by the way, Sean Cunningham wanted with Friday the 13th. Yeah. He hated the idea of Jason Voorhees, thought that was idiotic. And he wanted to tell tales of the unluckiest day of the year. That was his whole life. That would have been right? cool. So, uh, uh, season of the Witch, no surprise here. One of my favorite two Halloween movies. Uh, I love Season of the Witch. Part it's 4 really was going to be cool a movie. ghost story. It's a really cool movie. The only problem with Season of the Witch is that they didn't have enough money to make it the way it should have been made. That's yeah. right. It looks like a TV movie, but it's an incredibly smart, cool movie. Yeah, it's got a great story. and a great. Totally. It's got the stakes are so high. Children. 
you don't see that in horror movies. Yeah. You know, uh, yep. so that that was the stakes. No, the right. stakes made it great. So with Secret Santa, I just want to take holidays that most people don't make horror movies about and make movies about horrible people doing horrible things to each other on the holidays. So Dude, I, I was cool when I thought when I thought it was going to be a direct continuation. That was cool. But I think I like this better. Uh, it's pretty bad. Dude, this Easter movie is so wrong. It's And it happens in a church. <laughs> it is so wrong. Yeah, oh, my God, it's wrong. The most wrong Easter thing I've ever seen, I cannot remember the name of the movie right now, but it was like an anthology about holidays. And it was like a little short, really short short. I think it was called and Holidays. Is that what it was called? Yeah, one of them is like a Jesus Christ Easter bunny. Yeah. It is so fucked what up. What the fuck? <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, you, Adam, that's all like yeah. a nightmare for children. Um, but no, no I, man, no, I, I like the idea of the anthology. I really want to do thing. Easter, and I really want to do Thanksgiving. Because again, oh. nobody, does, nobody touches Thanksgiving, man. Nobody touches it. I know Eli. Oh, it's Ross. all Halloween or Valentine's. You know. Right. Exactly. It's always yeah. like, but, and again, like. I don't know, man. I, I just think I think there's I think people are missing it. I think they're missing the fun that can be had with some of these holidays. And again, they're always centered around family. So family has to be the evil. Well, and Thanksgiving has so many opportunities to do shit with because Thanksgiving generally, I don't know if it's just for me and my family, that's the one holiday you can't miss. You could miss right. Christmas, you could right. miss Whatever. Thanksgiving is generally the one holiday. The Whether you want to see Aunt Sue or Uncle Bob, you're fucking do you, going. Do you know Do you know that it, I, I was a criminology minor at NYU? Because cause, cause I was. <laughs> and um, uh, Thanksgiving has one of the highest spikes. It's one of the biggest murder days in, in the United States. It's a Holy huge shit. murder day. Are and, they all fans of the Detroit Lions and Dallas Cowboys? Is that Dude. All the people that do the murders. <laughs> the most often used weapon on Thanksgiving is the carving knife from the turkey. Get the hell out of here. For real? That's a true no. story. Don't I tell me how to movie. cut it. Don't tell me how to cut it. I can see the movie poster in my head right now. You just have the carving knife and like one of the relatives on the table or something. And the, that's, the, that's the poster right there. Yep. Boom. Done. Yeah. There was something I saw on your on your IMDb that I wanted to ask you about. I didn't get to read a lot about it. Uh, it was a Val Kilmer movie, Conspiracy. Uh, uh, what is your connection to that? <laughs> now that I just wrote and directed the fucking thing. Um, <laughs> I, was be, I was joking. I was no, joking. I, I had a question about Val Kilmer. <laughs> here's the thing. Okay? Was he in shape when you filmed this? No, I'm joking. I'm uh, teasing. Was he I'm difficult? Teasing. Was he difficult? Val Kilmer. Okay, I'm sure you all heard like a lot of bad stories about Val Kilmer. Yep. Okay. Yes. Multiply them to a factor of ten. Oh my okay, god. Okay, that, that's my question. Really? Single, he's the single worst human being I've ever known. Really? And I, I made a movie. Oh, personally, no. Wait, I made a movie for Sean Cunningham. Okay, and I'm telling you. That is a walk through the fucking daisies compared to working with Val Kilmer. Oh, my God. See, that's what I was asking. Val Kilmer is... Le okay, on day six of our movie, he assaulted me on set. He oh killed my God. us on set because he was drunk and high on painkillers, and he thought that I should look at his new pair of Crocs because they were the first Crocs in the state of New Mexico. Uh, wow. So I was setting up a shot with my DP. I said, hang on a second, Val. As I'm setting up the shot, I suddenly feel a lightning pain from my balls through my gut. Oh and my it God. Kept kicking me in the nuts. Landed me out on set. Wow. Had a headache, the whole thing. Batman's a dick. And that's day six. Oh my God! So you've got another like at least four weeks or three weeks with this guy. I, it, it, I, I truly, I have a book that I've been working on called "Val Kilmer Stole My Movie," um, <sighs> and it is all about the production of Conspiracy. It was, and I've got so much behind-the-scenes footage because my best friend in the world, 
guy named John Esposito who wrote uh, uh, Stephen King's Graveyard Shift, and he's oh, also, yeah. he's won the Writers Guild Award a couple times for the for The Walking Dead. He's he's a genius. Anyway. John and I um, met while I was doing Jason Goes to Hell because he's a good friend of Bob Kurtzman's, right? John Esposito was my second unit director on Conspiracy, and he did all of the um, behind-the-scenes footage. I have, like, 10 hours of bad behavior on wow. my set, <laughs> including, including a producer in a white T-shirt who's having a water balloon fight with the stunt team. <laughs> and running around, you can see everything flopping around with a white t-shirt, while Val Kilmer is fucking this Russian girl that he kept hiring and firing and hiring and firing in his, tra in his trailer behind us and won't come out to shoot the movie for six hours. And my producer is having a wet t-shirt contest with the stunt crew. Oh my god! Oh my god! Yeah, See, it was. I was, I was making a joke with you about, you know, what's your connection to it? Because I know I heard how bad Val Kilmer can be, but Jesus, did that, Val? Did he insist on wearing scarves in every shot, uh, Adam? No, 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 okay. because he wasn't. He didn't have his cancer yet. Okay, because he's like a I didn't. Okay, and I didn't know that was why he wore scarves. That's but why. every picture I see, he yeah. wears a scarf. That's why. Here's the thing. Um, Val, this is how evil he is. He had a super fan on set that he had asked me if the super fan could come to set, which I thought was really sweet. I was like, yeah, of course not. Who was disabled. She was in a wheelchair from Germany, right? So she had visited a bunch of his sets. So she's there to visit this set. Um, we were having a, a lightning storm in Santa Fe that night, right? While I was shooting. And Val demanded that she be taken away from set. He was tired of looking at her, quote unquote. Oh my God. My producing partner, Brian Sexton, the guy who, who created Skeleton Crew with my wife and I, my best friend, I mean, this guy is, he's, oh my God, he's amazing. Anyway, Brian Sexton was the associate producer on this film. It was the first movie he associate produced. He had to get this woman off our set right? She's in a wheelchair, guys, and he's running through a lightning storm with a metal wheelchair with yeah, this disabled yeah. woman in it to get her off the set. That's Val Kilmer. Man, I'm sorry I asked a question that had oh, to make no, no, it on that no, it's again, a, but... Dude, it's a, it's a good question, and he, it's hilarious because it's... I survived it. I lived, but... Richard Stanley and I have actually talked about this because you know what happened to him on on uh, Island of Dr. Moreau with this motherfucker, and the, you know it's it, it's like dealing with a a five year old who's on a sugar high all day long who somebody hands a gun to. Oh my god! That's I've seen somebody like was. that in the news in the past couple of years. Um, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, um, hey, the Diet Coke button has been removed, guys. Okay. There has been order restored to the Oval Office, so we're good, all right? <laughs> yeah, no I was kidding. trying to be subtle, yeah, no. but yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. That, Would, you that put him on the same level? Dude, I was, I'm dry, I was, I, I had, uh, a week before we were shooting, I had to pick him up at his chiropractor, right? Oh. And oh, we were going to okay. go back to his house, right? We're going back to, to his house in Santa Fe. Um, and... I'm driving him from the chiropractor home and he, you know, I'm going the speed limit, which I think was 65 at the time in, in, in Santa Fe. So I'm driving the speed limit and he's like, Adam, come on, man, like pick it up. I'm like, now we got to shoot a movie next week. I'm not going to the Hooskow because you want me to drive you faster to your house. Oh my God. He's like, Adam, you won't get picked up by the police. I'm like, why? And he goes, he literally does this. He goes, oh, my God. I'm your Huckleberry. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Jesus. Did I'm you like, look, Adam, did you look at him and go, Val, you don't look like you used to in <laughs> Batman Forever <laughs> anymore. No, I should have. I don't recognize you. I should have taken his finger and widened the circle. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, more like that, Val. 
he so yeah no val kilmer like is he in the new top gun that's being made was he, did he, he okay he is. great great help him. wait but i gotta tell you i think that it's a very kind of sad story and i think it's i think that i think the concept is that maverick has been taking care of iceman for all these years <laughs> because iceman's sick okay um i also know that tom cruise supposedly this is the rumor, but the rumor is that Tom Cruise had a talk with Val. Okay. Like a Perfect. talk, like he... Y'all heard his... Uh... Oh, yeah. 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 Well, you know Tom's not screwing around. Tom probably put up most of the money for that Mission Impossible. Yeah, I, I mean, know. Not... Dude, yeah, it's, he's yeah. the producer of the movie. I'm not condo- Josh, I'm not condoning the way he spoke to the people yeah. that were on the set. Because, listen, I, when I was in radio and I got yelled at by the station manager and everything, it sucks. Yeah. It makes you feel like shit. Okay, but there are times when you're doing something, or you're trying to get a show going, and people aren't doing what they're supposed to, and money is, you know, you're getting paid regardless. The guy who is footing the bill has a right to say something, He's but the maybe one that's just liable, in a different way. you know, right? Yeah. That's the problem. It's that it's here's the thing. The problem is it's not even just money. It's the fact that you the the situation has lives on the line. Yeah, that's the problem. It's like we're not dealing guys. We're not dealing with like it's not you're not getting your work done. It's you're endangering other people. Fuck that. And yeah. while I think he was very emotional, when it happened. I still got to say, guys, I want to tell you. That's not rare. That moment's not rare. If that shit happened on a set in L.A., you would not forget about a war. You wouldn't get a warning. You would literally be fired on the spot sent home. The fact that he didn't fire those guys actually shows remarkable restraint because he had every right to say off the set, go, you're gone. And he didn't, you know? So it's, look, I mean, just from SAG alone, just from the Screen Actors Guild alone, guys, the rules, we're doing a new film right now. Um, guys, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars just to test people and keep them safe. Wow. During a shoot. It's hundred thousand that's just for testing and safety. Uh, TV I, shows must be going crazy. Dude, I have to fly I have to fly to Dublin for two weeks to sit in a hotel before I can go to the country I'm shooting the movie in. Oh, to quarantine before yeah. you even go. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. I mean, that's where we are right now. So look, I I get it. I mean I get it. It's like and if you're the producer of the movie, by the way, I mean Guys, Sean Cunningham used to yell at us like that on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and the problem with Sean Cunningham yelling at you like that is Sean Con- Cunningham is a little, a little over five foot two. <laughs> so you, you, you want to giggle every time he does it. <laughs> so cute. So you're like poking yourself in the leg to try to not laugh at the oh, fact man. that this tiny little man is like... Rah, rah, rah. It's, like having, it's like having Louis De Palma... In taxi, yelling at you, you're like, oh. it's, "When's the laugh track coming in?" I mean, it's that silly. Oh my Did, god! So when Sean would yell at you, like on set or whatever, since you yeah. were had been such good friends with Noel, was it weird for you to? to did you almost not take it seriously because you're like, "Oh my god, he yelled at me like this when we were 12." You know, for it is, I actually, I got to tell you, by the time we got to shooting, and by the way, this is this is true. Look, I I, I have a lot of problems with Sean, but I will say this. As a producer, he's still one of the finest producers I've ever worked with from a standpoint of like having what I need on set when I needed it and solving problems and helping me solve filmmaker problems. He was great. So all of that is is, is the truth. I, I, I will give the devil their due. And in this case, it really is the devil. But here's the thing. He had done things and said things that were either so gross or so stupid that by the time he got to that place of like just yelling at me all the time, I kind of didn't give a shit. Yeah. And I was like, whatever, man, whatever. I mean, literally three days before the film ended, he, he threatened to fire me. And I was like, go for it. The whole crew will leave. The entire team will walk out with me and you're fucked. So go ahead, Sean. I heard one of the biggest fears in filmmaking is having your producers on set constantly. Like, but you uh, know what? But it, but it shouldn't be. And that's, th- this is, th- again, this is why I started the new company, was because I really, I, 
like my producer, my producing partner, Brian is, is my closest friend. Like he's a brother and we're, we're there to make the same movie. Like we're there to, 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 to protect the film. Mm -hmm. He will constantly try to make sure that everything financially is working correctly. That's fine. But when it comes to story, we've made all those decisions in the writing process. Mm -hmm. So when I get to set, he, he lets me direct. Like yeah. he, and by yeah. the way, he also has no interest in directing, which is awesome. Like it's rare. It's rare. Everybody else wants to direct. It's like, uh, stop directing guys. Like he's, <laughs> I, he's, not, not I got this. <laughs> yeah. He's not, he's not going to pull a wild, wild west on you and force you to no. use a giant spider. Robotic right. spider. No, no. <laughs> Honestly, Brian would just look at me and go, "Why would we be spending that money? What are you doing?" Um, so, no, it's, it no, it's Superman Returns. <laughs> that's the thing. It's like, and by the way, again, Sean was a very good line producer. He knew how to do that stuff. It's just, I, I, I feel like his ego is the worst thing about Sean. It's the scariest part of who he is. And here I was, a twenty-three-year-old kid, and I was orchestrating a real movie. And Sean was 40 when the first Friday 13th came out. Nobody gave a shit about Sean as a filmmaker before that. And I think that that bugged him in a big yeah, way. Speaking of the cool. liability that like Tom Cruise was facing on the set of that, I yeah. was curious, you've done these horror movies and lots of stunts and stuff. Have you ever had any real life injuries happen? happen on the set of any of your movies even slight ones you know just little yeah the only the, the well on jason goes to hell um a couple things happened one julie michaels famously was running through the woods without protection on her feet we had we had kind of made a path for her we'd cut all this pathway out for her but again it's the woods it's at night yeah and so she did the run we shot the run and then uh, I said, look, Julie, we need another one for safety. I, 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 there's a couple moments that I didn't get. She's like, no problem, boss. She starts walking away from me, and I see that there's blood footprints behind her. And I was like, Julie? I don't know. What'd you do? She's like, what are you talking about? I said, your feet. She's like, oh, I'm fine, honey. I'm fine. Good to go. I'm like, no, 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 no stop. And I walked her over. I said, show me your feet. She's like, she's like no, honey, I'm, I'm okay. I said, no, you're not. And she wouldn't go. And I literally scooped her up picked her up in my arms and walked her off set to the medic and they her feet were torn open oh man but she was a stunt woman so she was like no big deal um what's amazing and it's in it's in the documentary this whole thing is in the documentary okay. and there's a long interview with julie um she she said she had never felt so cared for and so protected on set that it was like one of those moments that for her, she was thinking about leaving the business right before she'd done the movie. And she was like, she said, if I, if I figured out, if I, at that moment I figured out that there were people like you in our industry and it made me go, I'm going to be in this forever. And by the way, I didn't hit on Julie. I wasn't making a move on Julie. There was no me too moment for her. It was just me going like, no, no, no. You're an actor in my movie. I'm not letting you get hurt. Were you insane? The other thing on that movie was that when we did the explosion with Jason, again, I'm 23 years old. I'm an idiot. I, I, I wanted to get as close to the explosion as I possibly could because wow. I was all excited. And literally, my, my, my explosives guys, Tom Bellissimo is like, hey, Adam, you might not want to stay in this close to the to the blast it's it's gonna be pretty hot you'll be a hot blast i'm like no i really want to i want to feel the heat of the thing he's like okay i'm just saying it. it's big we got a big bomb going off i'm like i got it so all the the whole cast everybody crew everybody is moving back 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 i'm standing there i've got my monitor in front of me right the okay. long lead behind me right everybody's back behind me the explosion goes off the monitor is on a C-stand. It goes flying into my chest, and I go flying against a van. And oh my bam, against the van when that Holy when crap. that goes off. Oh my it God, was amazing. Dude. It was amazing. Okay. I also got hit by a transpo truck on the movie while I was directing Julie Michaels in the car that she drives up on. Yeah. The transpo truck literally hit me 
and my head hit the windshield of the car and I rolled to the ground. The problem is the people from the bond company were there. The finance people were there. My, my line producer, Debbie Hayne Cass, runs out in the street, sees me. It's like, oh, my God. And everybody's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Adam got hit by the truck. They pick me up. Debbie looks at me. She goes, are you okay? I was like, I don't know, man. I'm a, I'm a little dizzy. I'm a little dizzy. And she says, she says, you have to be okay. <laughs> oh, no. Why? She goes, the bond company is here. If you're not okay, they're going to shut us down. Yep. We can't afford to lose one day on this movie. I'm like, okie dokie. <laughs> Literally, she walked beside me for the next three hours and, <laughs> and held my back, held my belt, oh my okay, gosh. so that I wouldn't fall over. That's true. However, wow. however, on Conspiracy, I had a... Um, I had a stunt coordinator who spoke to my explosives people behind my back and told them to make the explosion bigger. And my, the, the stunt coordinator and three and two other stunt people got burned and, gla and got cut up from glass because they stood too close to the explosion and then told the explosives guys to put more in, which I did not know they were doing at all, okay? They went to the hospital without telling me. The stunt coordinator drove himself and the two other people because he knew that he'd fucked up, that mm. I would never have said yes to that. So it never got lodged as a workers' comp thing. Like, they knew they fucked up. Like, all the stunt people were in on it together to do it. Okay, that moment, when I found that out, I almost fired everybody. I didn't because we're almost at the end of the shoot. And I'm like, I'm not going to get rid of everybody because I need everybody to be ready to go. But at that moment, I was like, fuck this. I'm never letting anybody get hurt on my set again. And so the guy who does my stunts, a guy named Freddie John James, who's an actor and stunt coordinator. Freddie played the cook in Secret Santa, the bald black guy. Okay. Yeah. Hey, that's Freddie James. I had over 200 stunts in Secret Santa. 200 stunts. Holy wow. crap. They were all it. performed by the actors in the movie. Oh. Not one injury. Not a bump. Not a scrape. Not a bruise. Nothing. 200 stunts in 11 nights. That's an incredible That's, stunt, that is, stunt crew. Yeah. That, that would be one you'd never want to get rid of, ever. Well, you know dude, what troubles I, when I do my classes, when I do my acting classes, the hour before class, because I teach on Tuesday and Wednesday nights in LA, I have my I have a studio in town. When when I do it, we do for an hour before class, we do Fight Club, where Freddie trains all of my actors in all the stunts they're ever going to need for set. Wow! So taking bumps and stuff like oh, all of you. Like, I mean, full flips, and, I mean, they, oh, they knowing how to take a shotgun blast, knowing how to do wire work, they all know how to do this stuff because I train everybody. Like, I'm like, look, if you're an actor, you know, you have to Keanu Reeves this stuff a little bit, guys. Like, if yeah. you know how to do a lot of this stuff, you're much more hireable. People want you. See, that you was know, my goal to... at one point. I was a pro wrestler, like, just on the independent circuit. Uh -huh. And I always thought that one day... I could do stunts because I've been doing all this wrestling and, and learning, you know, how to take falls and get hit and all that. And, but then I broke my back in a match. And so that just ended up that stunt work was my, was something I really was thinking about doing after, you know, after a few years and, you know, they don't get enough credit. No, they don't. People don't. They, don't. Uh, they, they, they should Academy make a, award. Yeah. They should have an Academy award, but it's, here's the thing. It, it's, that's a snobbery thing. That's some, yeah. that's, that's, that's just a lot of bullshit that, like, the people who are actually risking their lives, those are the people we shouldn't give a fucking award to? Are you out of your minds? Yeah, exactly. Like, they, they don't get awards because they're considered underneath somehow, right? And it also, actors don't like that the idea that somebody took the hit for them or took the fall for them is going to win an award for that performance, right? The mm. other thing is casting directors don't have, a, have a, an Academy Award. And it's like, okay, so wait a minute, the person who puts all of the actors in your movie shouldn't get an award for doing that? No. Mm -hmm. You know why? 
because there's a bunch of directors that don't think they're like I cast my films. I'm like, dude, you didn't ask the 25 people per character to come in and audition for your movie. That's bullshit. Yeah. Like that person works their ass off to do that for you. And the other thing is, cast and directors tend to be more women and more um, uh, and more people who are gay. And truly, so there's a bias kind of shoved out. It's bullshit. I can't believe that it's today. You know what I mean? I can't believe that shit is today. And you know what troubled me a little bit about what you said about the bigger explosion on yeah. that one stunt was we have a precedent in our movie history from the 80s, a little movie called The Twilight Zone. You bet. That should oh, teach hell. you right there yep. why you don't go behind your director and people's back and do bigger explosions. It's Absolutely. right there in the history of filmmaking. Absolutely. Uh, I was furious. By the way, the, the, the explosion's in the movie, and you can see the stunt people jumping. You can see them de- flying away from the debris. But I'm like, yeah, those, those, <clears throat> those people were dumb enough to do that, and they got hurt. And it, no. would have been, it could have been on you, man. You know, and that, yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it. It would have been hard, but at the end of shooting, so yep. I get it. Yep. It happens, man. But never again. It will never have happen on a set of mine again because, because I got Freddie and he, like, he, he is lit. We, we do not do anything without each other. So we can read each other in a moment. And this guy will never put any actor at risk ever. Ever won't happen. They will, you know. So Josh was talking about pro wrestling. We're both huge pro wrestling guys, and uh-huh. one of the greatest pro wrestlers, in my opinion, uh, technically, was Bret the Hitman Hart. He's a b- big time wrestler. He's world famous for never having injured one person that he worked with in the ring yes. for his entire career. There ever. you go. There you go. And that's that's and a lot of people don't recognize that as greatness, but it is because oh, it is great. it's a it's a dance. You're yeah, you're dancing great. with your partner. Yep. And you're protecting them. Yeah. You know, and you're trusting your them. You're giving them your body. It's the same thing with stunts, I'm sure. You're you, these oh. people that you're choreographing their stunts, they're trusting you to not put them in harm's way. Or Actually, if they yeah, right? I mean, I don't know. I heard the first rule of stunt work was like wrestling, where you go in and they're like your whole life, you've been taught not to fall down, but today we're going to teach you how to fall down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, the other part of it, it's it's also the fact, the idea, and I know this does work in wrestling, that the guy getting the hit is the one who controls the hit. Not the person giving it, the person getting it. Selling. They're selling it. Yeah, they're selling yeah. the move yeah. of, the, of the hit. And yeah, even for like, sure. even, let's say, like, someone grabs someone in the back of their, their hair, right? you're actually the one holding the person's hand that's lifting you up. Yeah. You know, it's not, yeah. it's, nobody's really lifting you. You're, you're lifting yourself through that person's, I mean, it's, it it's, it's and it's using leverage. Mm-hmm. Well, that, you know, that's another reason that Kane Hodder deserves uh, yes. more recognition than yes. he does because being a stunt guy, his entire career and also probably choreograph. Didn't he choreograph? Did you choreograph the fight with Steven at the end of uh, Jason Goes Hell, or did yeah, Kane? Kane? Kane and I did it together. We okay, that's that, what I thought. We, we did that whole dance together. That's what I thought. Uh, he's so he brings that to the table. He oh, brings yeah. all these other things. This this certain gravitas to his performance. So. Uh, this is totally off topic, but uh, now I'm back to being mad why he wasn't in Freddy vs. Jason. <laughs> totally get it. <laughs> now I'm pissed. And I'm I pissed would love to talk to him it. today. For real. It would be, be nice to get to, to talk to him about some of his work. Because uh, early on in his life, uh, you, everybody sees the scars, you know. Uh, he lived through a very, very brutal stunt gone wrong. He was so if there's somebody that knows, life. if there's someone I'm going to trust with stunts, it's a guy that actually knows what going what what a stunt gone yeah. wrong can do you know way, he kept he kept trying to get me to set him on fire in the movie <laughs> and i was like kane no look at what happened to you he goes he goes adam it can't get worse oh god <laughs> <laughs> you're like no kane but it really can <laughs> by the way by the way this is, this is my favorite kane hotter story um we're on the last day of shooting and my cinematographer, Bill Dill, had his son, Elliot, on set. Now, Elliot, he's, first off, Bill, Bill's a really tall dude, right? 
And Bill's wife at the time, Edna, was way taller than him. She was well over six feet tall, right? She's a model. She's gorgeous. Oh, wow. So the two of them, really big people. Their son, Elliot, when he was three years old, you'd swear he was six. Like he looked like a, you know, like a little boy, right? But he was actually a toddler. So he comes to set on the last day we're shooting, and Kane is in the full regalia because we had just dragged him to hell, right? We'd done the last thing. And um, so Kane is on set, uh, and Elliot, like, not scared at all. There's Jason. He's got the machete, the whole bit, bloody, everything else. Elliot, nothing. Nothing's upsetting to him, right? <laughs> Elliot's walking around the back of the stage, and we were wrapping out. We were going to have this rap party, and they were pulling the stuff off Kane. They are pulling the full suit off of him. And Elliot saw Kane, but oh. his back, everything was exposed. And that scared Elliot. Suddenly, Elliot oh. was really frightened, right, of all this burn scarring tissue, right? I can see that. So Kane, so Kane sees Elliot react, and he says, he says, hey, hey, Elliot, come here. Come here for a second. Come here. It's okay. And Elliot walks over, really timid, and Kane puts out his arm. He goes, go ahead, touch it. It's okay. Let me touch it. And so Elliot touches his arm, all this burn stuff, right? Touches it. And he says, see, it's, it's just like you. It just looks a little different, but it's just like you, right? The next thing you know, Kane's in a T-shirt, throws a T-shirt on, picks Elliot up, puts him on his shoulders, walks him around the rap party for two hours. Uh -huh. This kid on his back the whole time. That is awesome. And like, awesome. it was completely unafraid, like, loves Kane, totally. Get... And all, I just sat there and I said, this man just taught this child so much in that moment. Really yeah. just like lets him see that there are no differences between any of us. It's just skin. Like, this kid just got an amazing lesson wow. from this beautiful, incredible dude who plays our favorite psycho. Like that's an amazing. Like that's just fucking badass. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Kane. That's Kane, Kane. Kane would go back to the same burn ward that he yeah. had his, you know, his ordeal in, and talk to the kids and yeah. the people that had been burned, and he would try to coach them up. I mean, I watched his documentary to Helen back just recently. Yeah. He's an amazing. Pr he was. I I related to him a lot in his story from high school because. I was an athlete, but I wasn't popular. I right. was I was fat. I had braces. I was loud. I was I wasn't funny, but I thought I was funny. <laughs> I, I didn't get <laughs> funny till later. Uh, so I thought the punchlines were coming out well, but none of them hit. They all just peppered around. <laughs> so I was just good enough to be on the teams, but I definitely wasn't popular enough to hang out with them after the games. And Kane was kind of the same way. Kane wasn't popular, and Kane kind of had the last laugh if you ask me with his with his life so i really related to to a lot that he had to say and what he's done because yeah. yeah no he's he's a hero for sure mm -hmm. anyone that yeah how, I have how did your interview with there. him go uh for the documentary was it have you conducted it's that awesome. one yet dude it's awesome his his documentary it's he's he's amazing I so can't they, wait to hear the stories from the set he, of Jason Goes to Hell. He reveals stuff that is absolutely incredible. He's he's amazing. I mean, this it's come a long way, man. This documentary, dude, it's great. And we got we've got over thirty people on 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 uh, video already. Um, I've been shot. Oh my god, it took two days. Oh wow. Um, yeah, like, uh, God, I'm like, yeah. uh, can't even listen to myself. Um, <laughs> but but. Uh, but it's incredible, like, the, the, the number of people that we've already done. The problem is we haven't done John LeMay yet, my brother Kip. Um, there's, like, some essential people that I, because of the pandemic, it was like, there's no way. Yeah. And I'm not going to do it on Zoom. I'm not adding Zoom footage to this documentary. Yeah. The documentary is too beautiful. It's shot really well. Like, no, I'm not doing that. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, it's one of those things, like, I'd rather give it to everybody when it's perfect and it's great, rather than, oh, well, here's a rush job and here's your disc. Bye. Yeah. And, and we it. appreciate that, because that's not, you know, what we want is your vision. Yeah. It, you know, that's yeah. what we're buying. Well, look, and, it's, you know, know, I'm producing the movie. Edwin Samuelson directed it. Peter Brackey is the historian on the film and did an incredible job. The guy who wrote Crystal Lake Memories. 
Um, I mean, we've got like a fucking incredible team. Ali Rivera uh, produced the movie with me. She is unbelievably talented. I mean, we've got like this great team. And again, I'm, I'm not going to short sheet it. Like we're, we're going to, we're going to give people the best version of it. The funny thing is um, the number of people who are like, you know, well, we want it to be like five hours long, like Crystal Lake Memories. I'm like, no, stop it. Like, but what, but it's funny because so many people want so much footage. I'm like, all right, look, I'm going to make a feature length movie and then I'll pack the Blu-ray with yeah. as much footage as I can. Like I'll throw in a ton of deleted interviews and yeah. extra interview stuff. Like I'll put all that stuff on there. Um, but, you know, I've guys, I've, sh we've shot over 80 hours of footage. Jeez. Oh my God. Uh, how much was... time? Yeah. How much time does that take Adam to pick through and, and to put the story together? I mean, dude, it's endless. Yeah. The great news is I got the editor of the film is a guy named Eric Beatner, who is a guy that I grew up with in Connecticut. Um, who, by the way, the guy, Adam Craner, who plays Ward in the movie, the two of them are like best buddies. Oh, oh very cool. cool. This guy, Eric Beatner, and I, we lived together in New York for a while, and he's an amazing dude. Anyway, Eric is, uh, he's a genius uh, crime writer. He writes Pulp Fiction novels. He's written like 25 Pulp Fiction novels that are amazing. He's also the lead editor. Uh, he was lead editor on The Amazing Race. He did every single episode of Fear Factor. What? Uh, really? Yep. Yep. Oh, okay, so he knows how to put put together a show then, obviously. That point, like he knows how to take to a hundred hours of footage and go yeah. two hours. Got it. <laughs> I know exactly I know exactly what you're talking about. My friend works uh he used to work on MTV's Made. So they would film yeah, they would film for like a month, you know, trying to create turn this kid into whatever they want to be. And then the heat they would have to cut it down. Like, they would take an hour-long conversation with the coach. Say Adam's my directing coach. Adam's telling me something profound. They'll cut it down to, like, one sentence. And yeah. then that's, that's what's in it. That's all that made it. He talked to me for three hours, but they're using the one piece of verbiage. That's it. Dude, that's here's an the, art. Um, and when you look at uh, Secret Santa, so Secret Santa, I had three cameras rolling that entire movie and literally rolling all the time. So... Because I only had 11 days to shoot the movie, and then I, I had one extra day. So in the 11 nights we're shooting, I had 13 lead characters in the movie. There's 13 people in that cast that are leads. Forget yeah. about the, the, There's 25 characters in the whole film, but 13 leads. I had to have every line, every moment, everything covered on 13 people for an entire movie. That is a nightmare. Like, that is so much shooting. My editor, my, the first editor on Secret Santa who cut the movie with me, um, this guy, Chris Kirkpatrick, who is my partner Brian's husband, okay? Chris is the editor for all the Gordon Ramsay shows. Oh, for Hell's has, Kitchen and all that Hell's stuff? Hell's Kitchen, Kitchen oh. Master Chef. He cuts all that stuff, right? So, oh, shit. and this guy, he got my footage. And my partner called me, he's like, I was like, how's it going? He goes, it's not great. I was like, what? He says, he says Chris is actually sobbing. <laughs> the amount of footage you cut. I was like, too much. <laughs> I was like, wait a second. This motherfucker cuts Hell's Kitchen. There's 42 cameras in Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> like, exactly. And this is making him break down. Oh, oh my no. God. That's how much footage we shot. Can't wait. Can't wait. It's tough. It's, tough. it's good Man. stuff. I'm this very, stuff, I'm man, very proud of that man. Like that's, I'm very proud of that. Big time. Yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be an amazing documentary, man. I know it is. Thanks. Man. Um, I wish I could have backed it more than I, I was able to, yeah. but I, I'm happy that I was able to, uh, to back it because this is a, this is a movie that I believe in, and something that I've always been interested in because this is the first time that uh, the franchise of Friday the Thirteenth really took a chance, you know, and gave us something uh, fresh. And I'm sure there's so... Hell, you've told us stories tonight, you know, and I know there's still tons more. There are. You know, are. and uh, looking forward to hearing from all these different actors. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. 
Uh, is there anything, any projects other than that going on right now that you can discuss? Or uh, we're doing we're doing a new film called Dread that I uh, that I wrote with my with my wife and my partner Deborah that I'm directing. That's the next one that I'm going to be out of the country for. It's a big movie, um, so that one I'm doing next. That is a um, that's a thriller <laughs> that plays pretty much like a horror movie, um, but it's the story of three women who get trapped in a hotel um, in, uh, in New Orleans. We're shooting it overseas, but it is doubling for New Orleans. Who get trapped in this hotel um, that is run by a human trafficking ring. Okay. And yeah. three women have to get out of this hotel. What's fun is that one of the women is not what she appears to be. And these men have miscalculated. See, I love movies. Oh, well, that's... When I'm when I'm at Redbox or something, and I see any movie mm. where it talks about like a victim, but it's yeah. like the the people preying on her didn't know who they were messing with, you know? Yeah, yeah that... I love the revenge stuff. Uh, Last House on the Left uh, is yeah. uh. This is a little more. Do you guys ever see Raid: The Redemption? Yeah, I have the not raid seen it. Movies, no, yeah. it's it's a little more like the Raid. It's it's, it's, like a... it's it's more like. Like, there's a lady who is going to go up against an army of really bad dudes, and oh. she she ain't she ain't putting up with it. <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty badass, dude. Those are always fun. Yeah. No, that movie's gonna be fantastic. Like, if I could buy a ticket right now, I'd buy it. Thanks, dude. Yeah, we're we're doing that. We also have an incredible movie that um called Eat Me. Um, the, the subtitle on it is Fat Camp Massacre. Um, it's a camp horror film that takes place at a camp. Um, the tagline of the movie is, get ready for the real Hunger Games. Oh my god. Um, and it will be, for people of size, what Get Out was for people of color. Man, I never thought that Heavyweights 2 would go that direction. (laughs) Yeah, Ben Stiller. Adam just signed Ben Stiller. I fucking love Heavyweights. I'm a huge fan of that movie. I think that movie's amazing. I will tell you, this is... Here's the thing. <laughs> this is Heavyweights with, like, teeth. Okay? Oh, okay. Lord of the Flies and Heavyweights? No pun worse. intended. Worse. And I will oh tell my God. you, the single most disturbing, goriest thing Deborah and I have ever written is in this movie, and you will never forget it. I mean, okay. truly never forget. Holy shit. <laughs> it's, we finished writing, by the way, we finished writing the sequence. Every person who signs on to this movie signs on because of the sequence. They get to that <laughs> point, they're like, oh my God. Like, it's, guys, you remember the scene in Kingsman in the church when he shoots everybody, when, he, when, he, when, they, when they're all under the control of the chips on their, on their phones? Oh, yeah. And there's that amazing sequence to, to Freebird. Okay, that was the Fisher Price version of the scene that we've got in this movie. It's in it's epic, epic. You're Adam. You're speaking to me because I I recently have lost 119 pounds. Like no joke. Like uh, I've worked out like like yeah, I've worked out every day of the the lockdown for like 400 days straight. Good for so, you. Man. Yeah, thank you, man. I, I was gonna say though, like. I never got to go to fat camp. We couldn't afford it. So <laughs> I can't wait to go to fat camp with, with your and stories. Here's, here's what's great about this movie and what, why I'm so proud of it. Th- what's awesome about this film is that um, the people involved with the movie. So there's this woman named Lindsay Hollister. If you look her up, you'll see her instantly. Lindsay Hollister, if you guys ever saw the uh, Get Smart movie with Steve Carell. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's that great scene where Steve Carell has to do the tango with that very large woman. Okay? Yeah, yeah. That's Lindsay Hollister. She wrote the script with Deborah and I. Oh, fantastic. So she knows, she, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you're saying. Here's the thing. Two of the women that are, that are producing the film are also of size, right? So we've got, we've got. Uh, a company called Six with Heels is the one that brought us the project that Deb and I got involved. We started writing the script with Lindsay and this whole thing became a collaboration between our two companies. What's awesome about the movie is it's not about it's not about people getting thin. It's kind of about 
whoever the fuck you are, it's totally okay to be exactly who the fuck you are. And one of the taglines of the movie, one of the, one of the things that's said most often in the movie is, never trust a skinny bitch. <laughs> and it's True this whole idea. Been it's, but it's this whole idea of embracing whoever you are. By the way, the other thing that's like kind of cool about it is like my team, like when someone like Rebel Wilson loses all the weight or Adele loses a lot of weight, it's like, well, if that's what makes them happy, fuck yeah, that's awesome. Like, there are fat people who are shaming them for that. There are people of size who hate Adele right now, and I'm like, why? Yeah. Like, she's on her journey. You're on your journey. There's nothing wrong with you, and there's nothing wrong with her, man. As long as she's healthy, cool. Mm. Yeah. But it's about whoever you are, embrace what the fuck you are. Don't let anybody, like... Weight is one of the last places that people can bully each other on. And guys, I'm telling you, if you do a search for images on Adam Marcus, you will see a person that looks like they ate Adam Marcus. In my early 30s, man, I was big. Like, big, big. And I wasn't happy. That, By the way, that wasn't about somebody saying some shit to me. I just wasn't happy. Mm -hmm. So I went... I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I don't want to live like this. So you make a change. But there are people who are larger who are like, fuck yeah, I'm larger and I feel great and I'm good. I'm okay. Don't, yeah. don't mind me. And it's like, good for you. Like, I, nobody, nobody should be telling anybody how they should live. Yeah. You should live the way that it makes you feel empowered and good about yourself. It'd be a lot yeah. more happiness if people would do that. Oh, yeah. for sure. If more people cared about what they were doing as opposed to what Adam or Josh is doing, if you focus right. on what the fuck Alex was doing, yep. the world would be a whole lot more productive, a more peaceful, and a happier place to live. Yeah, and that's a dude. fact. Yeah. That's at the crux of all, and I'm not getting political at all. I'm just saying blue, red, whatever. People get so focused on, well, the red's doing this, well, the blue's doing that. It's like, listen, you're worried about this kind of crap when stuff isn't taken care of in yourself or your own home. Right. So deal with your house first. And you're not going to be happy out things. there until you're happy in here. Yeah, 100%. Yes. Totally. Totally. And, Hey, Adam, I was going to ask you a question. You, so you, in your early 30s, you said you were heavier. That's when I gained a lot of my weight, too. And, I, and I'm five years sober from alcohol. So Good for you, man. Congratulations. Yeah, I was Mr. Bartender, and I used to do stand-up, and I used to be the guy that, like, oh, you know, I'm not going to drink tonight. And then I would literally get off stage, and I would have <laughs> seven drinks in the well already bought for me. So yeah. what do you do after you've had seven drinks? Now I'm going to go try to get laid. And then after I get laid, we're going to go have breakfast somewhere at three o'clock in the morning. Right? right. So that's, that was a cycle. We do that every night for five years. And then, so what, what my point though, I, I got to a point to where, um, I just wasn't happy anymore with, and I, and another thing that was really weird about this, it was when I gained all the weight, I used to get teased. People would make jokes. Sure. People would sure. say stupid shit. Because and it would hurt. Too. Because like the one area that people can still be bigoted about. Yeah, yeah, for and for sure. And what would happen is I would start feeling bad about myself, and then to soothe myself, I would eat more, which would make me fatter. Yep. yep. And Look, here's, here's the thing with food addictions: what people don't understand. Look, I mean, I'm I'm very I'm very lucky in that I've never never drank or done drugs. I just never have. I've That's never amazing. Had it. It's not something I've ever wanted to do, and I've never done. Um. By the way, I don't, I don't drink know, alcohol either. Like Wait, food. but I, I don't have a soapbox about it. Like, if you, I'm all about you do you. Like, yeah. whatever you want to do, as long as you don't hurt somebody else, we're good to go. Like, mm -hmm. I don't See, care. I, I, I'm the same way, but I've been in situations where I turned down a drink. I haven't drank alcohol since I was 21 because uh, I tried it and I was like, this isn't for me. But I've been in situations where I turned down a drink and it's like all of a sudden I'm being accused of being a snob. Being better than everybody else, oh, judging yeah. them, and I'm oh, like, you're oh, no I'm fun. Just turning it down, you know, dude. That uh, that goes under what Peter says about Paul. Says more about Peter than it does about Paul. That's yeah. what that goes under. It's like they they're they're commenting on their own bullshit, not about you. Look, here's the thing: I don't drink. My wife, like, has to have a hot toddy before bed, man. Like that's like she wants that, and I'm like, honey, do it. Plus, I know I'm gonna get laid, so that's awesome. <laughs> so, 
So, <laughs> so awesome. I never, I never tell her to turn down her drink. I'm like, have a drink, baby, go for it. Um, I don't like the taste. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> hey, Adam, Adam actually has a Mr. Boston's bartender book next to the bedside. He's like, hey, is it time for your cocktail? Well, yeah. Honey, yeah. <laughs> what about making tonight? Gosh, I can whip that up for you. Um, uh, yeah. So, no, dude, but, but here's the thing. Um, with food, the, what happens, and it's, and this is the thing that people who don't have a weight problem don't understand. If you're an alcoholic and you put alcohol out of your life, which you can do, right? You're like, I'm not going to bars. I will remove it from my home. People cannot drink in my home because I don't want it around me. Alcohol's gone. If you're a Coke addict and you don't want to be around cocaine, you can actually live a life where you're never around cocaine. If you're addicted to food, you have to yep. eat every day. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And food doesn't judge you. Food is safe. It's, it, it, it only makes you feel good in that moment. So that's why we get on that cycle. And that's one of those things that people who don't have a problem with it never think about. Like, oh, yeah, well, you have to eat to live. It's not like alcohol. It's not like other addictions. It's you got to eat it. So, yes, can you take the crap food away from you? Sure you can. But come on, if you live with a family... Yeah. Someone's going to have some crap. Yeah. Yep. And, you know? and when, if you have a family, say you have kids or whatever, the crap food sure spreads out a lot more. Like if you get some pasta or you oh, get dude. some pizza, yep. it stretches a hell of a lot further than, you know, some grilled chicken breasts and some broccoli. Cause that shit is expensive at the bar, at the restaurant. It. Yep. That's another yeah. thing is the, is the price, you know, the shit Healthier food, is, food is more expensive. Yeah. Yep. It, yeah, the dude, no, I, 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 I never, I, I don't think I ever got to your LVs, but I mean, I lost 60 pounds and I was like, I can see that I can, I, I, I was researching you all week. I didn't want to come into this because uh, yeah. I'm, I'm anal. I probably, that's probably why Josh had me introduce you. Cause I, and I've been a fan of yours, Adam, for years, thank by you. the way, I, and, you, and I want to thank you for something. Thank you for having the guts to make that movie because I got so much enjoyment out of that film and I am going to watch secret Santa tonight. I promise you. you. I will, and I'll tweet you about it. I'll tell you what Please I think. Do. Please do, man. That'd be awesome. But we yeah. a review too. Yeah, no, we should. And but I, what I was gonna say, Adam looks. You look great, man. In the research, Thanks. I saw. So whatever the hell you're doing, do it because it's working, dude. buddy. Thanks, dude. Yeah, yeah. It's mostly keto. Keto is delicious. Keto is exquisite, feels Adam. <laughs> yeah, it feels great, man. It feels great. Meat, cheese. But again, dude, I'm telling you, like to each their own you got to find your own path and again if you're cool being your size be your size that's fucking great man you know i don't yeah i, I just don't get I, I i don't get our need to judge anyone it's it's because i i, I really think okay so i think people when you said that people project their bullshit on other on other people they like to deflect their, yeah. their issues. So it's like, yeah. if I'm having, okay, so I don't drink. Okay. Now, if Josh and you can drink and, right. and be normal and go to work and have a productive life and pay your bills and be a good husband, that's fantastic. Right. I, on the, I, on the other hand, guys, I was, I, I'll be the first to admit, I was like Farley or Belushi. I had to, I would be the first one to show up to the party and I would be the last one to leave. And I don't know what that is in me. I really don't, but that's in me, and I know it is, and that's the way it is with working out. I've worked out 400 straight days. That's probably not normal, okay? But I'm channeling it into a, into a positive for me. Right, I, right. I don't know why I'm like that, but I can't be normal. But if you guys can be normal and drink, more power to you. But, dude, you know what? If you, but if you can take whatever, whatever addictive part of your personality there is and get addicted to things that make you healthy and feel good, yeah. yeah, like yeah. okay. <laughs> Robert well, Downey so much... Jr. does the same shit. He yeah. does yoga and works out every day. What's scary about nowadays is there's so much to be addicted to. Yeah, like I'm addicted. My biggest thing is cigarettes. Uh, that's something I'm been slowing down on, and I'm trying to get past that. Is, but like when I broke my this back, is our biggest this this motherfucker is our biggest addiction. Yeah, yeah that, the cell phone. I, I'm getting to that too. 
when I broke my back, a doctor pretty much got me addicted to painkillers because uh, he overprescribed, you know, and I was like, oh, well, I've got anxiety and depression and these things make me feel good, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, I'm 10 years off of pain pills, but I got really bad on those after I broke my back. And yeah. you're right. You got to find uh, things to get addicted to uh, that bring you joy and, and make you feel better. Uh, the channel I do, that's an addiction of mine, but it's so, it, it makes me feel so good, uh, to do it. And it, it's happiness. Uh, Alex, I think you're kind of addicted to your goal of working out and everything. And you kicked ass, you know, like he, Adam, no joke. This guy every day for the past, what, 400 days is it's almost there's a, tweet, 400 days, yeah. there's a tweet up with him working out, running, uh, seriously. And uh, you can see, you can see dude, fantastic. you can see every pitcher from when I was 358 to wow. being 239. And, wow. and I've had, I've had That's people, amazing. well, and it's all natural. I, yeah. nothing. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. I found, I, I typed in my calorie count for my height, my weight, and my age. And I just, whatever I was supposed to eat six days a week, I would do that. And then the, the seventh day, Adam, here's the beautiful part. Cheat day. I do whatever the hell I want on Saturday. Yeah. yeah. It's working, man. And yeah. the phones that he's talking about, we are addicted. And uh, that plays another role in weight gain. Uh, sure especially when you're sitting around on the phone all day, eating all day. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And exactly. Just swiping through. Um, but, yeah, this it's it, to circle back to what started the conversation, it's cool that you're making a horror movie that points that out you know, to be happy with who you are. Because yeah. you a horror movie does not just have to be uh, brain brainless violence and gore, you know, and jump yeah. scares. Yeah. You can have you can have a horror movie mean something. And uh, well, honestly all the all of our favorites really do. Okay. Yeah. The truth is, you know, anyone who thinks that Night of the Living Dead is about zombies it wasn't watching. Exactly. Because it's really about the Vietnam War and about the civil rights movement. That's what George Romero was interested in. He made a movie where he used allegory to make make a much harder story easier for people to digest. The best movies are about something else. You know, mm -hmm. they're about a bigger issue. And those are the ones that stay with us. So is that why, okay, so is that why Nightmare on Elm Street is still the first one? The original, the West Craven 19, because it's turning your back on whatever, whatever is holding you from right. yep. be, being boogeyman. who you should be or. The boogeyman. Yeah. Denying the boogeyman your focus makes that boogeyman go away. Okay. And that's the same thing with, like, and that, for anything. Like, if I put all my focus and energy into something that's not good for me if right. you finally get take the power away then you finally have control again is that kind of what yes guys okay. think of it this way okay and again forgive me but I, i'm going to be a little political um have you noticed in the last month how there isn't this sense of dread every time you wake up in the morning and turn on yep. the tv yes mm -hmm. yeah yeah i agree with <laughs> yes i've noticed the noise has dissipated because we stopped focusing on the monster if you put the monster in your rear view, the monster has no power over you anymore. Exactly. It's gone. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, the best, the best thing that ever happened was when they took the monster's Twitter yes. <laughs> away from him. Yes. <laughs> and suddenly there was no place else for him to bang that stupid drum. And you're like, great. I, by the way, misinformation on Twitter, just on Twitter, in one day, dropped by 70%. I know. Twitter sphere from one guy being removed from Twitter. I don't know, and and that's you know I live in I live in the South in Arkansas. My family sure. is on that is is in that party and stuff. And the thing is, that misinformation is they think it's real. They think it's true. They don't they don't see it like we do. And you know, and if I put myself in their shoes and sure. I'm hearing these things and believing it, I am yeah. just as pissed. You, you know, I'm furious, but you we bet. know better, you know, but I, it's a tangent. I know, but uh, it, it's it's what we're facing. But you're right. Part of the world right Things now. Have just, what's that? It's just part of the world right yeah, now. Yeah, there's no escaping it. it it's Look, guys, but it has. 
We're the, in, we are literally sitting in our homes to this day because of this bullshit. Yep. Like, yep. like if you really think about it, they try, they politicize the last year of a, a virus has been politicized. A thing that does not care if you're Republican, Democrat, or alien, they don't give a shit. Nope. It's a virus. It kills you and it don't care what you are. I don't pick favorites. Today, guys, today we hit 500,000 deaths in this country. Half a million people in the United States have died in half in a year from this. Because, because it was politicized. That's it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the reason. That's just and, fucking stupid. Yeah. We all uh, gotta, wake up. gotta wake up and just treat each other right. That's what it's about. We gotta just we, we gotta treat each other right. In the words of the Wild Stallions, and I say it at the end of every narration, be excellent to each other. That's all you got to do. That's all you got to do. Adam, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Alex, did you have any closing questions or anything? No, I don't. I just Well, one quick one. I want to know what sport John DeLamay lettered in to get his varsity jacket. <laughs> okay. Well, I can tell you this. In the high school that I went to as a kid, um, I grew up in Westport, Connecticut. And in Westport, um, which is about 40 miles outside of New York City, um, so the high school was built around an existing theater, okay? The theater department I worked in from the time I was 11 till, till my teens, and then I created my own theater company. That high school theater, we would pull in over $100,000 a year in profit. Jeez. The oh, high school crap. theater paid for the football team. That's excellent. Right? That's amazing. That's right. fantastic. The the last year I was in high school, myself and that guy Adam Craner, the guy from Jason Goes to Hell, played yeah. more. The two of us, it was the first year ever that in our high school we got Letterman jackets for the theater department. Oh, that's phenomenal. So when I gave John the jacket, I was like don't tell anybody. <laughs> Theater department. Oh my god, that's and amazing! Like this is so badass. I'm like, there you go. and it fits his character too. It you totally know? Does. It does. It totally. That it makes so much sense that that would be what his letter jacket was. Uh, what he lettered in. Yeah. Um, man, this has been time has just flown by. This has been a great talk. Uh, like I said, we don't like to do the whole formal thing. Just. Totally. Sit back no, this and chat, great, you know? guys. And, and honestly, I wouldn't have been on this long. I, I, I have writing to do tonight, and I wouldn't have been on this long if I didn't have a good time. This was awesome. Yeah, right. yeah we, we real, I really enjoyed I know Alex has to do, having you on here. It's been an honor, man. Thank you uh, for, for Jason Goes to Hell, Secret Santa, everything you've done. I cannot wait to see Heart of Darkness. Uh, and, uh, yeah, just like I said earlier, be excellent to each other out there, okay? We... We gotta love each other and uh, pass it on, um, Alex. Hey, thank you very much, guy Adam. Thank you, thank you for everything for childhood memories for every. You know what? I told this to somebody we interviewed before. I grew up in a pretty rough situation where my mom and dad uh, weren't always present. Okay, right. uh, and sometimes your movie was the person watching me. So thank you. Dude, I mean that. that. That's so, beautiful, man. It means a lot to me. That's yeah. Nice. These, so, these horror you. movies. It's something I've I stated too. Uh, I was bullied uh, in grade school, in middle school, and horror, going to rent horror movies on the weekend and just sitting home watching them. Uh, uh, that was my. It was like my escape, you know. And I did. I wasn't constantly uh, feeling that sadness and stuff. And you know, Jason goes to hell. That we, I told you, we played on the playground, you know, me and, me and the friends I had. So it, it was a big part of that, too, you know, so thank you for that. I'll, okay. I'll tell you guys a story, um, and I've never told this on, in an interview situation ever. This is a personal story, but um, I was at my high school reunion a few years ago, and uh, so I'm, you know, mingling with everybody, and, and uh, out of the people that I graduated with, well, I, again, I, I came from a beautiful town that was, you know, uh, every, it was very affluent. Everybody was very rich except us. We had nothing. Um, but uh, so I'm, I'm mingling with all these really wonderful people, and, and I'm sort of one of the only media people 
uh, of my class. And so everybody's kind of excited about that and talking about films they've seen of mine and whatnot. And that's all lovely. And this guy, this guy, Peter, who, um, who I haven't seen in decades, walks up to me and he's like, hey, Adam. And I, I turn, I'm like, oh, hey, Peter, how the hell are you, man? What's, what's going on? And he says, um, he says, you know, you're, you're a big part of the reason I came, came to this reunion tonight. And he said it in a way that I was like, uh-oh, did I do something to this dude? Like, yeah. did this, is this going to go bad? Right? I'm like, oh, no. And, and I said, well, why, why is that, Peter? He said, well, when I first got to Westport, when he did, I'm speaking as Peter. So when I, when I first got to Westport, uh, I was in sixth grade. And um, it was our last year of elementary school before we went to junior high. Said, and, you know, Westport's pretty clicky. And I was like, yeah, yes, it's very clicky. He goes, well, like for the first two and a half months, um, I ate lunch alone every day. I did not have one friend. Nobody would sit with me. Nobody spoke to me. He says, it wasn't even that I was like bullied. I was just invisible. I said, okay. He said, that was until the end of October. You walked up to my table and asked if you could sit opposite me. And I suddenly was like, oh, yeah, that did happen. He's like, yeah. He said, and then the next day, you got two other people to come and sit with us. That's and then cool. a couple of days later, my whole table was full. He said, and I had friends from that day on. Like, that was when I made friends. I was like, awesome. oh, man, that's, that's really cool. He says, yeah. He says, and then there was that guy, Bobby Meyer, who, uh, you know, was picking on me. And I said, yeah, I, I remember that guy. He was a real asshole. He says, yeah, well, I, re I remember when you beat the shit out of him for me. <laughs> and I was like, right. I did do that. He's, <laughs> like, he's like, yeah, you did it for a lot of people. And the rest of the reunion, he kept bringing other guys over who were like, oh, dude, you kicked John O'Sollinger's ass because he was bullying me. And I suddenly remembered, like, oh, fuck, man, that's right. Like, I spent years, because I was really bullied when I was really little. And once I got big enough, I just started kicking everyone's ass who had ever, like, done anything to me. Yeah, oh, yeah. And, and then when I'd see other people bullying other people, I would just, like, grab them and toss them. And, like, I was like, fuck that. And I suddenly remember, like, that was my growing up. Like, I was, like, the guy who beat up bullies. Like, I wouldn't allow bullying. I hated it. So when you say this to me, you have to know it hits me in a place that's so primal to who I am. Because when I hear, like, especially horror fans, because horror fans tend to be the bullied kid. It's why... It's why Friday 13th was so wildly popular. Because it's about a little boy who is bullied to death. It's what it is. And it's what happens when you get, when that, when that person you've uh, assaulted for so long gets out of your, your, your grip and they suddenly turn back on you and deal with you. It's why there's so many asshole jocks in the Friday 13th movies. Because <laughs> those are the guys who made our lives hell, right? Yes, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. I never, so, it never felt like I fit in. Right, right. And horror fans tend to be, by the way, it's why horror fans are the best fans in the world. They are. Even the ones who fucking hate me and hate the movie, they're the best fans in the world because they tend to be the people who were kind of on the island of misfit toys because they were either more creative or smarter or funnier, but they weren't as athletic or they weren't as good with girls, or whatever it was that their problem, but they were ostracized. And dude, I'm telling you, like, if anything I make can make people feel better in moments of that darkness, dude, that's the coolest shit. Like, that's, that's better than any award I could win. That's better than any money I could make. That's, that's the real fucking deal, man. So... I can't tell you how much it means to me what you guys just said. Like, I seriously cannot tell you how yeah. much that means to me. More than it's anything a, else. It's a fact, Adam. It, like, there mm -hmm. were 
I mean, my mom used to, she used to hang out with the Gypsy Joker biker gang when I was a kid, and she used to, my dad would go to work, and then she would go to their clubhouse or whatever, and she'd leave me with, like, if I was lucky, if I was lucky, she'd leave me with, like, frozen pizza and then, like, five bucks to go get movies, right? And Jason Goes to Hell, I'm telling you, Return of the Living Dead Part 2, Jason Goes to Hell, uh, whatever else. We had a, a rotation, and your your film, I'm telling you, got me through a lot of dark, dark nights. So I I appreciate it more than you know. So thank you. I, I appreciate you telling me, man. Thanks. Yeah, it's a fact. And by the way... Help me socialize with other fans of it. To play it, it was so cool. It... it it, it helped me socialize with other kids, man. It really did. You guys need to keep an eye out. I can't. I can't tell you about it yet. Um, but but keep an eye out for when it happens. Then we'll we'll talk about it once once it does. But we have a TV series that's going to hit a lot of this stuff that we're talking about right now. That is, it's the single best thing I've ever done in my life. Um, oh, that's cool. that's and, uh, saying something. Then that is saying it, something. It's great. I wrote the first ten episodes of the show while in quarantine. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's insane, but it does a lot of this. What we're talking about right now is a lot of what the show is. Um, and I'll, again, when, when it gets announced, we'll, we'll talk. All right. The world needs something like that right now. They really do. Um, I agree. Man, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there's only, there's only one more thing me and Alex have to ask you. We talked yeah. about this, kind of put yeah. our heads together. You know that we're uh, being held prisoner by Master Evil, having to watch bad movies every week. Yeah. Um, Alex, I'm not good at this. Can you can you put in the request? Well, uh, yeah, I can. Uh, Adam, appreciate you being on the show. You've been gracious. You've been great. You've been more than just wonderful, giving us this amount of time to, to, to spend with you. If we could just ask you for one more thing. Yeah. Could you? Could you please figure out a way, or maybe you just do it yourself, uh, to break us out of our, our our cages, please, and get us the hell out of here? No more bad movies. Yeah. Oh. Um. Huh. Uh. I. Uh, you know. No, I mean, I'd really like to. What? What on? Oh yeah. Oh okay. Uh, guys. Uh, listen, I got. Dude, I think Adam Marcus has been compromised. Yeah, he went. He, he someone got to him, uh, and he went completely w went rogue on us completely. He's not. Uh, he's not helping us. You've had eyes on the rodeo clown the past few days. He's not the one that did it, is he? I have no idea. But I mean, I thought things were going well in the interview, and I thought that we had used our charm and and yeah. and, and and everything we could possibly do to to make shit happen. And it once again we struck out. So. I don't know. I'm depressed. He's probably, Master Evil's probably watching right now, laughing. We tried it. We had to try. Hey, at least this time we did an interview and didn't get kidnapped. And Well, it would have been nice to get taken out of here, I guess. Well, hold on uh, one second. We, you're excited that we didn't get kidnapped uh, after an interview, but we're currently still kidnapped. So you, was, how, we're going to get kidnapped from our kidnapping? Yeah, and just end up somewhere worse, you know. Worse? Where, where we where, have to watch Disney it, cartoon sequels. So, like, just dead? Is that where the worst would be? No, <laughs> like we would have to watch the made-for-straight-to-video uh, straight to Disney cartoon sequels instead of bad horror movies. Oh, my God. Like, you mean, like, The Little Mermaid? Like, uh, when they had, like, The Little Mermaid, like, aerials back in time? Like, when she's, like, on a time machine? Yeah. Like, Pocahontas okay. 2, you and know? And then they've got someone doing, like, Sebastian's voice, but it's, like, somebody trying to do an imitation of somebody trying to do an imitation yeah. of Sebastian. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. That could have been worse. But, man, uh, I'm going to try to sleep on my cold, hard mattress now, but that – I enjoy talking to him. We'll, we'll fill in Master Evil on the details, I guess, but uh, I think Adam's too good to, to make Master Evil's movie, so – yeah, I also I always would also concur with that. Master I think Evil Adam Marcus deserve, marks a little bit above Master Evil. Yeah, Master Evil doesn't deserve uh, the genius and uh, 
and everything that Adam Marcus brings. So, uh, yeah, man, thanks for hanging. That was uh, fun to talk with Adam in all seriousness. Thank you all so much for watching uh, our three-hour discussion here on Getting Sidetracked with uh, Alex and Josh. Thank you. Be excellent to each other. And, uh, yeah. Mahalo, dog. There it is. And there it is. What up, Josh? What up, Alex? Slash track. What's going on? I'm busting in the damn head. When Master Evil comes to play, and Mama says that it's okay, Alex and Josh are stolen away.